Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Let's get started with the afternoon agenda items. We're going to start off with the recreational demand model overview. Lou Carr Harris, I guess you will be presenting remotely whenever you are ready. Yes, hi. Um, would I be able to share my screen um, for this? Or shall I, see I just, it. Um, just to um, just so I can click through the slides or. Um, it says I can't share the content. Um, okay. All right, can you uh, see my screen now? The uh, PowerPoint? Yes, we're good to go. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Lou Carr Harris, an economist at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And today, myself and Kim Bastille will be discussing the NEFSC's recreation demand model and the development of a decision support tool. Um, I've been working on uh, this type of rec demand model for the past several years in, in various applications. Um, so I intend here to provide a very high level overview of the model. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts in it, so I'm not gonna get through it all uh, down to the details, but I'm focusing on giving a kind of a high level overview of, of, of the model. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Kim, who is a data analyst and programmer. Um, and she was hired uh, in May specifically to work on developing the decision support tool uh the the online unit interface so she'll discuss about that show some example results and then discuss how we collaborated with the stakeholders throughout the process so the rdm uh, consists of two main components the first is a discrete choice model of fishing decisions uh, so we use angler survey data to estimate structural behavioral parameters representing the importance of trip attributes so think of harvest or trip cost on anglers' decision to fish. Uh, with these parameters, we're able to then compute the expected utility an angler would get from a fishing trip with specified attributes, as well as several other important trip level outcomes. And when I mention utility, we can think of utility as uh, kind of satisfaction or happiness. Um, and so I'll kind of use those uh, terms interchangeably throughout. Um, and then the second component is a fishery simulation where we use those parameters plus available fishing data, fishery data to simulate the fishery under current and alternative conditions. Um, and we can, you know, we compute these trip level outcomes under both scenarios and aggregate over all trips to assess kind of coast-wide impacts of, of regulations. So starting with this first component, um, I wanted to begin by giving a brief uh, background on the intuition behind discrete choice method um, to kind of help help you all understand the the data setup and what the model is actually estimating um, so beginning with what is a discrete choice um, it's any situation in which a decision maker must choose between a discrete number of options so for example which mode of travel a commuter takes to get to work which car to buy which job to take and whether to recreational fish or not discrete choice methods are designed to model these type of choices and help to understand why choices were made um, discrete choice methods originated in the marketing and transportation literature and since and since then have been applied to various different fields, uh, including commercial and recreational fishery contexts. Um, importantly, the results can be used to evaluate or predict market behavior behavior. So in our case, we're, we're trying to uh, replicate the, the market for recreational fishing and assess how the market responds to changes in um, fishery conditions. Uh, discrete choice methods are grounded in random utility theory. So under random utility theory, discrete choices are modeled under the assumption of utility maximizing behavior. So economists assume that individuals, um, when faced with a discrete number of options and have some sort of constraint, either a budget constraint or a time constraint, will choose the option that maximizes their utility. 
So the a decision maker will receive some utility from each of the options. The amount of utility can depend on the characteristics of the options, characteristics of the decision maker, and unobserved characteristics. And they'll choose the option that provides the greatest overall utility. Going back to the, the uh, choice of uh, uh, how to get to uh, work example. So I can either drive my car to work or I can uh, ride my bike to work. Um, and if we boil down you know, so, uh, those this choice scenario into some important or salient attributes, we can think of like the travel time and the cost. So relative to taking my bike, the, the travel time of, of driving my car is a lot less, but it's more costly than riding a bike uh, in terms of fuel cost. So every day, you make a decision to uh, ride my bike or, or, or drive my car, um, depending on whichever option I think is going to maximize my utility. Um, so bringing it back now to a recreational fishing context, um, in order to estimate these type of models, uh, we need a uh, couple pieces of information. So first we need um, data on English choices among a set of options. So whether they chose to, uh, did they choose to fish when presented with the opportunity to do so? Uh, we also need some characteristics about the options. So for example, how much fish was caught or how expensive was the trip? And perhaps we have some characteristics about the anglers themselves. So uh, for example, how avid of an angler are they? If we have these pieces of information, we can then estimate the relative importance of each characteristic on anglers' choice and satisfaction. So we went out and collected this type of data through a mail and web survey, uh, angler survey that was conducted in 2022 with individuals who held marine recreational fishing licenses from Massachusetts to Virginia. The survey collected information uh, about anglers' fishing experience and avidity, as well as demographics like age and education. Um, but importantly, it included uh, a section uh, called the discrete choice experiment. And an example, I've, I've, I've shown here an example choice question from, from the discrete choice experiment. Um, so when they got to this section, the respondents were presented with three options. Um, trip A and B were fishing trip options that were characterized by different numbers of fish caught and kept and a trip cost. And trip C was an option to do something other than saltwater fishing. They were asked to compare the, the attributes of each option and choose the option um, that they liked the best. Um, so you can see here, um, just looking at this specific example, trip A is a high catch, high cost option. So the angler uh, could keep two fluke, uh, 22 black sea bass, and it cost $160 versus trip B, which was a low catch, low cost option. Um, so they could keep one fluke and 10 scup. Um, uh, for, and it cost $10. So, um, we, we were, we kind of manipulate, these type of questions are designed to kind of elicit the trade offs that anglers are willing to make between the different attributes. Um, so the respondents answered, uh, six of these questions. Um, the attributes, the catch and the cost attributes varied within each question, but also across all six questions. Uh, contained in each survey, and each survey, uh, and there were 30 versions of the survey that each contained a different set of six choice questions. Um, so we used the variation in anglers' choices, um, and the variation in the catch and cost attributes within and across choice questions to uh, parse out the relative influence of these attributes on overall angler utility or their 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 choices. Um, and this is this discrete uh, choice experiment method is um, has been extensively used in the rec fishing literature. So it's not like we created this method. Um, so we've kind of just building off the the previous research um, that have used these methods. So I've uh, included the the quantitative uh, parameter estimates from the the uh, discrete choice model at the in the back uh, of this presentation as a backup slide, uh, but I'm not going to present those now. Um, here are just, uh, I've just kind of outlined a quick summary of the model results. 
So we found that of the three species, harvesting fluke contributes most to angler satisfaction. Um, we found that the value to anglers of one harvested fluke is approximately equal to the value they placed on releasing 13 fluke or harvesting two black sea bass, releasing 11 black sea bass or catching 46 scuff. So it's really the harvest of fluke and sea bass that are, are driving angler choices and, and utility. We also found that fluke and black sea bass are substitute species. So increase in the harvest of one species reduces the value of harvest of the other species holding all else constant. Um, we also found that increasing uh, trip costs reduce angler satisfaction, which makes uh, uh, conforms to economic to it, intuition. And lastly, we found that angler satisfaction from not fishing increases with age and decreases with angler ability. So in other words, um, older anglers are less likely to, to go fishing, whereas uh, anglers who are more avid, measured by the number of trips they took in the last year, are more likely to choose to go fishing. So just from this choice ex uh, experiment, we can extract a lot of information about the market uh, for wreck fishing and the trade-offs anglers are, are willing to make between different trip attributes. So what can we do with those discrete choice model estimates? For one, we can compute the monetary value anglers place on keeping or releasing fish or the monetary value associated with their um, the satisfaction that they derive from, from keeping or releasing fish. So these two plots show the median willingness to pay for an increase in fluke harvest on the left and uh, increasing black sea bass harvest on the right. So if we look at this uh, left plot, the value ang anglers place, the median value, median willingness to pay for harvesting the first fluke is worth about $30 to anglers. And that value increases with the number of fluke kept at a decreasing rate. So the, the second fluke kept is worth a little bit less than $30, the third one worth a little bit less, and so on and so forth. Um, on the right, we have median willingness, the median willingness to pay for a harvest of black sea bass. Um, so the value of the first uh, black sea bass harvested to the median angler is worth about $16. And again, that that value increases at a decreasing rate with uh, the number of black sea bass harvested. Uh, we can also use those uh, discrete choice model results to estimate the probability that an angler would take a trip and the expected harvest of that trip based on different trip outcomes. So in this plot, I've, I've simulated 20 fishing trips. They're identical except for the number of simulated, the simulated number of summer flounder harvested, which uh, varies from one to 20. So as the, num the simulated number of summer flounder uh, harvest increase increases, you can see that the, the choice probability of, uh, the probability of taking a fishing trip increases. Um, and that's represented here by this uh, black line. Um, we can also compute the expected harvest of summer flounder on these different uh, fishing trips, uh, which is simply the, uh, the product of the choice probability and the simulated number of summer flounders kept. So as, as the simulated number of summer flounder kept increases, so too does the expected harvest. Um, we can think of this graph as kind of representing changes in individual demand for fishing conditional on on different um, trip outcomes. So as, as the trip becomes more attractive uh, through increasing harvest, the individual's demand for fishing or their choice probabilities also increases. However, a more practical benefit to this discrete choice modeling approach is that it allows us to conduct counterfactual simulations and assess their effect on overall angler satisfaction in dollars and other trip attributes. Uh, so for example, harvest. Essentially, we're asking what would choices be under alternative fishery scenarios? And that brings us to the, the second main component of the RDM, which is the fishery simulation. So we use those structural parameters and available fishery data to simulate trips under current conditions and alternative conditions in which some aspects are manipulated. So we can change the regulation. We can account for the projected length distribution of the stock. Um, we compute the trip, trip level outcomes under both scenarios and aggregate those outcomes over all trips. 
So in the last plot I showed you, I just simulated you know, 20 different trips and show, showing how individual demand and harvest um, varies um, through increases in you know, simulated harvest. Um, but here we're essentially doing that same exercise, but on a much larger scale. So we're simulating hundreds of thousands of trips um, and then assessing the, 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 uh, the effect of, of alternative fishery conditions. The fishery simulation is a multi-part algorithm with three main components. The first is to simulate choice occasions under baseline 2022 fishery conditions. And a choice occasion here is, is, is essentially the same thing that I showed in the choice experiment. We are, we are uh, replicating um, uh, individual, uh, we're, we're re replicating a choice scenario where an angler can either choose to take a fishing trip with different attributes or choose to not go fishing. Uh, and we're doing that again for uh, hundreds of thousands of simulated trips uh, uh, under 2022 fishery conditions. Then we have to calibrate the model and we do this to determine how many choice occasions to simulate and ensure that their outcomes are similar to observed trip outcomes in 2022. And this is important uh, because we want to ensure that we are adequately representing the size of the market for recreational fishing in the baseline year, as well as uh, uh, the, the quality of the good that's being evaluated, which is recreational fishing trips, is, is similar to the quality of the, the good in 2022. So once we do that, uh, those two steps, we then simulate or we re-simulate the choice occasions under alternative 2024 fishery conditions um, that vary in the, the regulations or the projected length distribution of the stock, which affects the recreational catch-up length, or the projected catch-up length in, in 2024. This algorithm is repeated 100 times. And each time we generate new data to account for statistical uncertainty in the input data. Um, I'm not going to go into the data sources uh, now, but I have included a brief description of the data sources at the back of this presentation in the backup slides for anyone that's interested. Um, the output of the model includes predicted total uh, harvest and discards in numbers and in pounds, angler satisfaction and dollar values, and uh, projections of the number of fishing trips or, or you know, overall demand. And we compute the median value of the 100 iterations as the relevant summary statistic. Um, so uh, one of the most important aspects about this version, this year's version of the model is that we are baking into the model any uncertainty that is exploitable in the input data. Um, so the model, we run it 100 times, and each time we draw new values from the estimated distributions of directed trips, catch per trip, the projected 2024 population numbers at length, uh, distribution for fluke and scup, which again affects the uh, projected 2024 recreational catch at length, um, the mean weight per harvested fish in 2024, and angler behavioral parameters. So essentially anywhere, any source of input data that is characterized by a point estimate with some variance or uncertainty around that point estimate, we are, we are uh, incorporating that into the model uh, through our, our 100 iterations of the model and, and uh, resampling from, from those distributions. Um, here are some results uh, of, the, of the RDM. So these, this is projected total harvest weight under status quo measures that I sent to the council a few weeks ago. Um, uh, going from left to right, um, we have black sea bass, scup, and summer flounder, total coastwide harvest in pounds. Each dot represents one iteration of the model. And the, uh, the figures uh, show the density of, of, the, of the outcome. Um, I've also plotted the RHLs for each species. Uh, in the horizontal black line. And from the figures, you can see that the full range of outcomes of, of harvest uh, weight uh, for each three species, the full range fell above um, the RHL for each species, um, which you know, triggered management action under this percent change approach. I wanna to touch on some key, key improvements uh, from last year's version of the model. So I think the, the, the biggest improvement 
was incorporating the MRIP statistical uncertainty in, in the input data. Um, second, we run the model at the state fishing mode and daily level, which enables users of the tool to adjust the open season by single days or weeks and, and obtain projections by fishing mode. Now, last year, we also were able to um, you know, adjust the season by single days or weeks and provide estimates by fishing mode, but we had to do so using post estimation or post model adjustments rather than having these features uh, baked in. And remember, last year was the first time, you know, we, we used this model. So we weren't quite, uh, we didn't have a, a good understanding of the features of the model that would be most useful to, to managers. Um, and so now we, we've, you know, we've had a year, we've already done this for a year. We, we've seen um, what the stakeholders uh, want to get out of this model. And so we've incorporated a lot of that into the model to make it most uh, useful for the managers. Lastly, um, we account for population demographics when predicting total demand for recreational fishing. So we know from our discrete choice model results that older anglers are less likely to go fishing um, and, and more avid anglers are more likely to go fishing. Um, so we're, we're accounting for that by um, drawing from uh, angler population data essentially in the simulation model to, to kind of better characterize uh, total fishing demand. So to summarize, the structural econometric model provides key information about what drives anglers to fish. And, what, and we saw that it's essentially, you know, it's, it's driven largely by increases in harvest of, of summer flounder and black sea bass. And second, it enables a tractable analysis on the effect of counterfactual regulations on fishery outcomes. So any regulations or environmental conditions that lead to increased harvest, uh, the model is gonna pick up, pick that up and, and predict the uh, uh, increase in total demand for, for wreck fishing. Also, unlike previous approaches for predicting harvest, the RDM accounts for angler behavioral responses to management and in, in terms of you know, demand shifts as well as the projected length distribution of the stock, at least for scup and, and fluke. So if the projected length distribution of the stock in 2024, um, uh, you know, there's projected to be more larger fish in the ocean, then the simulated fishing trips within the model are more likely to encounter legal sized fish leading to the higher harvest, for example. Also the model, uh, predicts changes in angler satisfaction and dollar values, as well as fishing trips or demand under proposed regulation, which allows for consideration of socioeconomic outcomes in, in these management decisions. So we might have several policies that get us to the same level of harvest that meet the harvest objective, but they might vary in um, you know, the, the socioeconomic values. Um, so by you know coupling these the harvest outputs with these socioeconomic outcomes, you know, we can, can make decisions, we can choose policies um, that kind of maximize angler welfare or angler satisfaction. Um, so with that, um, I will turn this over to Kim Bastille and she'll talk about how we develop the online decision support tool. Thanks, Lou. Hi, everyone. Um... Yeah, so I've been working on the decision support tool, which is just a user interface that allows managers um, to interact with Lou's um, recommend model code. So this tool was developed collaboratively um, to ensure transparency, and we sought their input on some data issues that we were having. It's the first public R Shiny app developed in the NOAA cloud, and by um, using cloud processing, we were able to reduce the model runtime from about six hours, uh, which is what it takes on, you know, our local machines, um, to down to about 15 minutes in the cloud. And we also um, now have a space that managers can go and interact with the model online. Uh, we plan to continue collaborating uh, to improve the tool. We've been working on it for about six months, so definitely some opportunity for improvements moving forward. Next slide, Lou. So we've been working with the Decision Support Tool Working Group, which is comprised of uh, state managers and technical committee members and other folks 
we've been meeting with Leslie to get their feedback on the tool and uh, to incorporate any features into the tool that would help them um, make their decisions. Uh, about two weeks ago, we gave them access to a beta version, and last week they were able to get full access to the tool. Um, it's about 30 folks who can use the tool this year um, because the cloud does come with a cost. So to keep the cost low, we've um, reduced the number of folks who can log into the tool. Um, during those same six months, we had three meetings devoted to the model side of things or the, the green side of that timeline. Um, we met with, uh, with them about data concerns and um, sought their advice on, on uh, you know, which years to use and uh, along those lines. Um, we also had a deep dive where Lou gave a full hour plus long uh, presentation about the model. So when they are using the tool, it's not a black box. They know what goes in and, and what comes out of it. Uh, next slide. This is what the tool looks like. It's available at recreationalfisheriesdst.com. Once the users log in, they can select which state or states they want to explore. Um, the state's uh, regulations drop down and the default settings are the 2023 regulations. Users are able to you know, find scale, uh, manipulate the length of the season or when the season is open the bag limit for that season and the minimum length of the fish that can be kept during that season. Um, once they've made their decisions, they click the run me button on the lower left and um, next slide. And about 15 ish minutes later, uh, the results populate this tab. There is a download button um, so folks can save the, the results that they have just run um, and compare those on their local machines. The outputs include a summary of the regulations selected, so just an output of what you chose on the previous slide, uh, angler satisfaction in dollars, uh, harvest, release, and dead discards in pounds of fish and in numbers of fish, and an estimate of the number of trips. We include uh, status quo estimates or estimates under no change in regulations. Um, alternative estimates are estimates under the alternative regulations that you chose in the previous uh, tab. The percent difference, just the difference between status quo and the alternative, and a percent under harvest target, which is just how many times out of the 100 iterations of the model does the alternative regulation meet the harvest target. Um, we do that for all three species um, and all three modes, including all the modes combined for all of the states selected in the previous tab. Uh, next slide. Huge shout out to everyone who is able to provide feedback or data or uh, just help us along the way. It was truly a collaborative process pulling this together and we really appreciate everyone who was able to help us. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and Lou and I are happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Having attended a lot of these RDM working group meetings, uh, to simply say thanks today would be a huge disservice to everyone involved here. Uh, I mean, we went from two years ago just simply taking the current years. MRIP estimate as a projection and saying, well, this is what we expect to catch next year if we keep the regulations the same. To now, going back to what you have here on slide nine, we see a distribution that takes into account not only do we think how anglers are going to behave, but as well as various characteristics here of what the actual resource looks like to get a more informed projection of what harvest may look like if we keep regulations the same. And then to go one step further from there and to from last year, whereby you had individual state biologists give Lou a set of regulations, he'd sit there for six hours, hopefully keeping himself busy 
while it was running and waiting for all these to come out to now you can have individual users from each state running this their own and get results in 15 minutes truly incredible the amount of information we have uh, so again just want to give credit where it's due because you just can't say enough to everyone involved here uh, so that does bring me to a question uh, going back to slide nine at the very bottom of the slide I hadn't seen this here before decision maker characteristics set it population averages from Maine to New York Given that we are talking on, and this was actually slide nine in the PDF of the presentations. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, so given that we have mass to North Carolina in the room, what potential impact is there from this line about characteristics of population averages from Maine to New York? versus what we're actually dealing with mass to North Carolina. What does this potentially mean and what is a pathway to improvement in the future? Yeah, so uh, good question. So in, in this instance, this was just kind of a toy example. Um, so I used the, the behavioral uh, the, the angler utility parameters to simulate just 20, uh, 20 trips. And, and I just wanted to uh, highlight in, in, in this plot, how individual demand for fishing changes if we if we change um, you know, the number of, of summer flounder that can be capped. Um, so this was just a toy example. So I just set um, all the variables at you know averages. So I had a trip cost of 36, which is kind of like a weighted average uh, in one of the states. I'm not even sure of, of all the modes combined. Um, zero catch of other species. And I just set the decision maker characteristics at a population average just for this example, um, just so that I could keep all those constant, constant and increase the expected harvest and, and just you know, highlight how, how individual demand changes. In the actual model, we're, we're, I'm not setting anything at population averages. So in, in the simulation model, I use data from the, I forget, the most recent expenditure survey data to create a distribution of uh, decision-maker characteristics, so angler characteristics, which is for our, our purposes, angler age and avidity. So I have a distribution of the population in, I think it's, I have four regions in, in, from that data. It's aggregated to four regions. And so, in the in the simulation model, I'm actually drawing from that distribution. So I'm I'm assigning angler ages and angler avidities based on population data. So if we're simulating um, a fishing uh, a trip, yeah, if we're simulating a trip in New Jersey, then I'll draw from the distribution of angler demographics um, that are from New Jersey. So this was simply just a toy example. The model, um, again, draws from a distribution um, of angular demographics in that state or region. Jason McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lou and Kim, uh, just reiterating what, what Adam just said, uh, fantastic work. It really appreciated the refresher on the RDM and, uh, it's great to see your, your updates and, and, the um, that shiny apps, uh, fantastic. So great, great job on all of that. Um, my question, I'm not sure if it's for Kim or Lou, or maybe you both want to take a crack at it. Um, but what I was wondering about is you have a, a set of parameters that are generated from your survey on the angler behavior parameters. And I assume those have a shelf life uh, to them. And so my question is, you know, it, is there, is there like something known about how long those parameters are kind of good for? Um, and if that's not known, is there a plan at NOAA 
to kind of update that survey sometime in the near future or on some cycle or something like that. And, um, you know, hopefully that that makes sense. What I'm trying to get at is if if there is this need to update it on some cycle um, and it's not something that Noah is already thinking about, uh, we as managers might need to um, think about that a little bit. So I'd appreciate any comments you have um, on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that um, it's important to update these parameters every several years. Um, when we started this project for the fluke management strategy evaluation a couple years back, we were using data from 2010. Um, now we have data from a survey that occurred in, in 2022. Um, I actually haven't compared the kind of relative values uh, that anglers place on these different characteristics between the two surveys. Um, however, so there are kind of, we, we've also looked into this in more detail for cod and haddock. So cod and haddock angler survey is uh, re, uh, re-implemented every five years. Uh, so recently Scott Steinbeck and I actually did compare the relative value that anglers place on keeping cod versus haddock between a 2019 survey and a 2014 survey. And we did find that, you know, angler values, uh, we found some significant differences in the relative value of, of, cod, of cod relative to haddock. Um, that's potentially due to the kind of extreme changes in, in that fishery that occurred between the two surveys. So in 2015, the, the, the cod bag limit dropped from like nine fish to zero and and cod bag limit has been floating around zero and one ever since um so that might contribute to you know these different angler values um, but that's kind of an extreme uh extreme scenario um it's not often where bag limits drop to zero um on the other hand uh another wreck fishing econ economist in the southeast david carter He's actually experimentally tested the stability of angler preferences over time by implementing the same exact survey um, uh, within uh, five years apart from each other, and, and he did found, find that angler values or yeah angler values were relatively stable between surveys. Um, so given we kind of have like some conflicting results. Um, I think it would be best practice to continuously update these maybe every five years. Um, and I, but I don't know right now if there's anything in the works to secure funding to, to run another survey and maybe someone else can uh, touch on that. Um, but. No, thanks for that, Lou. And yeah, that that's good. So, you know, I, I think I'm in agreement with you. A good ballpark might be this five year um, cycle at least to start and and maybe you're right maybe there's a a way to kind of look at it as a function of I don't know a couple of these characteristics like regulatory changes or changes in catch limits or something like that so um, interesting to um, say the least but um, good to know that there probably is some cycle to this that we should be thinking about to make this tool kind of um you know uh persist for a while here so i appreciate that yeah thanks jason justin thank you mr chair i'll just quickly echo what previous speakers have said this great presentation and really fascinating modeling approach and i think like a lot of people around the table i'm really interested to see in the coming years if, if this model bears out as a much better way of predicting fishery performance um i've got a two-part question First part is uh, relative to the fishery simulation model and training the model on the one year of data, 2022, is, is the approach going forward going to be that as we have more years of sort of doing this process under our belt that the model will be trained on sort of multiple years of data or will it always be the most recent year of data? Um, so, we have to calibrate the model to some baseline, um, and it's difficult to calibrate it to more than one year of, of data. 
Um, however, the, the other sources of data that go into this model, like catch per trip, um, we've uh, reached a decision with the working group about what years of data are for this version of the model were most appropriate uh, to use. So we, we settled on using the most recent two years to project catch per trip in the future. But in terms of like the calibrating, calibrating the model to a baseline, um, I have to think more about how we can potentially use more than one year of data to calibrate the model. It's difficult to calibrate more than one year, uh, especially when regulations change. So that's why we use this one year of you know effort data um, and and to to calibrate the model. Um, but going forward, it's it's possible that we can kind of use more than one one year to to represent the, the baseline fishery. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so second part of the question. So I'm looking at that slide that had all the <clears throat> the various inputs for the fishery simulation model, and, and you know one of them there is directed trips, which comes from the MRIP data. Certainly, we've had a lot of conversation over the last year or so here about the potential that we now think there's some bias in the effort survey in MRIP. Um, I'm wondering if you think it's a fair fair thing to say that relative to the way we used to do this, where we were sort of just using MRIP data to predict the future performance of the fishery with this approach because the directed trips, this effort input is only one of like a bunch of inputs going in here that we might sort of be, I don't know what the right word is, kind of mediating or, or washing out the potential impacts of bias in the effort survey um, in terms of predicting how the, how the fishery is going to perform in the future using this modeling approach versus the old way of doing it. Um, so, well, first to note is that we are in incorporating the uncertainty in those point estimates of directed trips uh, for our baseline year, which is 2022. Um, so if those point estimates have high vari uh, variance or they're uncertain or high PSEs, and we're going to get a lot of variance in the result outputs. Um, in the future, well, we, we don't have the final estimates of the Emirate bias due to the question ordering issue. Um, but once we do, we will incorporate those um, revised estimates and their um, uncertainty in the model. Uh, we just don't have those yet. So it should be, and I think they're running the pilot or the, the large scale experiment um soon so those should be available in a couple of years so once once they are we'll, we'll incorporate those estimates uh, perhaps reduced our uh, effort estimates into the model as well as the uncertainty i'm i'm not sure that you know using mrip point estimates and their variability is washing away anything um, the model is simply just um, projecting out uh projecting outcomes based on you know, the, the emirate variability, the, or the, the, the fishing effort variability, the catch per trip variability, and all these other sources of variability. So I'm not sure anything's getting kind of washed away. It's more like it's all being incorporated. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answered your question. But. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Lou and Kim and the team. Really amazing work. Uh, I have a question just kind of ties into what Justin and Jay have been asking. I'm just curious, you did mention you've been doing this in other fisheries for years. Uh, have you gone back and looked at how well the uh, discrete choice model kind of tracks with the following year's MRIP data in terms of effort and catch? Um, has it worked out pretty well? Because kind of assumes rational behavior, right? And we know that behavior is not always rational and there are other variables. Yeah, no, good point. Um, so for this version of the model, um, or so sorry, last year's version of the model, um, we, you know, we, we ran the model last year, we had some projections, and we won't know how accurate the model performed last year, because we, we don't have um, the final estimates of harvest in 2023. 
those will be available in mid-April, at which point we will assess the model's accuracy uh, for last year. And going forward, I think we'll continue to assess how accurate um, it performs. Greg Bellavance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Lou and Kim, for your presentation. It's pretty interesting. I kind of guess in my own business, I run a little angler survey with my customers all day, every day, trying to understand how they think. And this is a, a good step forward in helping us understand as managers you know, how anglers will behave with different rules and so on. So I think it's a, a good thing to keep working on. I had an observation and, and a question, if I could. So um, when I was looking at the angler survey results, and the survey questions themselves, and um, it's, I started to think about the impact of a, a recreational fisherman's history in the fishery and how that might impact the survey. So as an example, if you're um, a dedicated shore fisherman and you look at a, a cost of $160 versus $10, right? That, I, you may be influenced by that. So I'm not gonna pay 160 bucks to go fish from the beach, but if you're always running around in a, a big, fancy sport fishing boat, that might seem like a, a smaller amount and influence you there. So I was wondering if there's any uh, any attempt to get sort of an angler history or, or recreational like preferences like within their, like a little history of them as part of a survey. And if not, maybe that could be something that you think about um, in the future surveys. And um, yeah, like question, well, if you wanna chime in on that, I can stand by on my question. Yeah, I was just going to mention. So w we do control for angler fishing avidity in the model. So how often they went fishing, in the uh, you know how many trips they took last year. So we do account for that, and then we match those you know that that those utility parameters that reflect how more avid anglers, um, the likelihood of more avid anglers choosing to fish. We match those with population demographics within the simulation model. I think what you what you alluded to is kind of the mode specific estimates. Um, so right now we don't uh, break our discrete choice data into different modes. Um, we, the 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 choice experiment like just wasn't designed uh, to to be broken down by mode. Um, that would require probably more more data, more surveys sent out. Um, so right now, what we're estimating, I guess, is kind of the average preferences across all modes combined. Um, but you're right. I mean, in the future, we could think about kind of breaking uh, our tailoring our surveys to anglers' primary mode of fishing. Because um, again, you're right. Like the the costs are just uh, you, know, you know can be very high. You know, the one that I showed, the hundred and sixty dollar. I mean, that's very high for a, a shore fisherman. So they might never choose that that option. Um, um, but it's definitely something to think about in the future. Rick. Thank you. Yeah, and so my question now was, um, I'm just trying to understand if there is any relationship between, uh, so once we start to use this model to break it down into the state level for management measures, I'm trying to understand if there's a relationship between a state's or a region's past performance um, under certain regulations, and if that influences how the model works or, or if this is a completely different way of looking at things. So as an example, if a state just um, had a, in whatever year you're looking to analyze, um, harvested a, a lot of fish under a set of regulations, would that be a punitive type of a thing or would that be considered more of a reward that is a starting baseline um, from a higher level. And the same as if you had a state or a region that fought less than you would have expected under a set of regulations, would that be helpful or hurtful to them? If the model takes that into effect or if I'm just not understanding it properly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess it's a, a good question and the answer is a little bit complicated. Um, so we do calibrate to uh, 2022 or like there's a, a year lag essentially because we don't have all the data for 2023 to calibrate. Um, but there's three key factors that determine the projected harvest. So there's 
text per trip. And we're using the past two years, the most recent two years of data to project catch per trip. There's the regulations relative to 2022. So if the regulations are more restrictive in 2024 than they were in 2022, the model is going to uh, project a, a lower harvest. And then there's the catch at length distribution, um, which is based in 2022 and then adjusted for the length distribution of stock in 2024. So if there's more, you know, if the catch at length projected 2024 catch at length distribution shows a higher proportion of legal sized fish than 2022, rel um, holding everything else constant, then there's going to be more harvest. So everything is, is kind of anchored on 2022 and the model will pro uh, project outcomes um, uh, in relation to how those different factors change relative to 2022, if that makes sense. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I can have a good answer for whether, you know, if, if states have harvested, um, you know, if they, in 2023, they harvested less than expected um, under no change in regulations. I don't, I'm not sure how the, like it's a model. Well, I'm not sure how to answer that question really. Uh, we are, we are, do have a meeting of, uh, about this issue next week. We're talking with Corinne Truesdale, I think uh, a little bit more about this uh, issue. So we're happy to have you on the call to discuss it more then. Thank you. Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Lou and, and Kim for your presentation and for your development of this of this model. I think it's going to be a very useful tool. Um, so I had two questions. Um, one was relative to um, one of the slides about projected total harvest weight. I don't remember what slide number it was, but projected total harvest weight under status quo measures. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, uh, so you, you had mentioned, and that shows that, um, all for all three species, um, we're going to be a, a, above the, uh, recreational harvest limit. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. I just want to make sure I understood it properly. So then were you able to run or, or, or will you be able to run in the future? Um, what what the projected total harvest would look like under, for instance, the um, projected um, reductions that we're going to be discussing today, you know, for summer flounder and scup and possibly tomorrow for black sea bass. You know, how, how does that fall on, on a graphic like this? That's the first right. question. Yeah, so these are, like you mentioned, projected harvest next year. If we don't change the regulations, but the input data does change. So we have different catch per trip data based on the most recent two, two years of data. We have a uh, recreational catch at length, which is a function of the population length structure in 2024. Um, so in order to achieve whatever reductions are um, necessary, uh, users of this tool can log on to this, the online user interface and they can select you know, different sets of regulations. So if there's a reduction, a required reduction across the coast, I mean, perhaps uh, folks might uh, assess an increase in the size limit or a decrease in the bag limit. So they can choose all those um, regulatory um, options within the tool and then um, you know, you run the tool from this page and you get to the results page. Um, and this will show you, um, both the status quo values by state. So in that other slide, I was showing you like the coast wide harvest from the model in the, in the tool, it, it shows you the coast wide or the state level harvest under status quo, as well as the harvest under whatever policy, um, uh, option that you chose. So. It gives you the alternative value option, um, the absolute value, as well as the percent difference. So if there is a required uh, 
you know, 28% reduction in summer flounder harvest. Um, the states, each the state managers can go onto this tool, uh, play around with the regulations and um, hit run me and see how, what percent reduction the model predicts um, under those set of policies. So for, for this example showed, you know, a reduction in, in uh, gup and, and summer flounder harvest pounds of 22 and 27 percent, for example. Um, so that's how, you know, we'll be using this tool for a kind of tactical management advice. All right, thank you. Um, and then my, my second question is um, relative to, you know, angler satisfaction, or I think you refer to it as angler utility. Um, in New York, anyhow, we've often heard, particularly from the for hire industry, about the, the perception of catching fish, you know, angler perception of catching fish, that even if the probability of catching, even though there's a, a probability uh, um, where an angler is likely to only catch one legal size fluke on a trip, um, if the bag limit is one, then there's less of an inclination for anglers uh, to go fishing. But if the bag limit is, for instance, three or four, even though they're probably only going to catch one of legal size, then there's then there's more of an inclination for anglers to participate. Um, did you come across that at all in your survey, or is this somehow factored into the output results? Thank you. Um, so yeah, great question. Um, this is this is not factored into the results, but you know, other research has shown that anglers view bag limits as an indicator of success. Um, right now, we are running the model uh, through uh, by using the values that anglers place on harvesting and releasing fish. So they have some, they get some utility from these features. Another way, I mean, Another way that this kind of type of model has been developed or uh, thought about uh, has been to kind of estimate the value that they place on different bag and size limits. Um, so we are not doing that here. Um, it's definitely an area for future research. Uh, and if we if we do send out another survey, I think that we can kind of experimentally test this within the survey to see, you know, um, you know, the value anglers place on bag limits versus actually harvesting fish, and perhaps even use this simulation model to kind of ground truth to see, you know, which specification uh, performs better or predicts harvest more accurately. Um, but that's a, that's a good point. Um, and the bottom line is, yeah, anglers view the bag limits as indicators of success. Um, so I'm hoping that we can kind of, uh, extend that research a little bit more, uh, using this fishery as an example, uh, perhaps in the next survey. Thank you. Lou and Kim, thank you very much for the presentation. Be interesting to see in five years, how things pan out, see if everything matches up, hopefully. With that, we're going to move on to our yep. next agenda item. Uh, we're going to, the council and the commission need to adopt the 2024-2025 summer flounder recreational measures. Holly and Chelsea, are you ready? Uh, yep, just as soon as the, the presentation gets pulled up. So just while I'm waiting for that to, to get up, I'll just... Uh, I'll just start by saying that this is the, the first year that uh, we are considering setting two year recreational measures for summer flounder and uh, scup at least. So this is based on the um, harvest control rule framework and addenda that that um, implemented the percent change approach and that included uh, consideration of, of setting measures for two years at a time. So we're looking at uh, 24 and 25 summer flounder recreational measures. I can get this clicker to work. Oh, 
Uh, so the objectives for the council board today are to identify the percent change in harvest that is needed under the percent change approach and the associated uh, harvest target for summer flounder. For summer flounder, we still have the option for the council and board to identify either a set of coastwide measures that would be an identical bag size and season uh, in all in all state and federal waters or adopt conservation equivalency, which has been um, in place for a number of years that includes um, harvest that is constrained by the state or regional measures with non preferred coastwide measures and uh, precautionary default measures associated with that. And I'll get into that later in the presentation. And then the council board could also provide, consider providing any preliminary guidance to the technical committee on any adjustments needed to state measures if uh, if desired. So in 2023, the, the council and board adopted regional conservation equivalency for summer flounder where the harvest is controlled by the states. Those non-preferred coastwide measures are, are written into the federal regulations, uh, but they are waived in favor of the state measures. The non-preferred coastwide measures for 2023 can, uh, consist of an 18 inch minimum size, a three fish possession limit, and a May 15th to September 22nd season. Um, the combination of regional measures is designed to be equivalent to this set of non-preferred uh, coastwide measures in terms of coastwide harvest. And uh, let's see, we also have a set of precautionary default measures that would be implemented in any state or region that failed to develop adequate measures to constrain uh, or reduce landings as required by the conservation equivalency guidelines. So the precautionary default measures for 2023 include a 20 inch minimum fish size and an open, uh, two fish bag limit at an open season from July 1st to August 31st. The actual regional measures that are in place in 2023 include uh, a set of various uh, size limits ranging from 15 inches in North Carolina to 18 and a half inches in New York and Connecticut. The bag limits range from one to five fish. And then the Southern states, except for North Carolina are open year round. And then the states, New Jersey at North are, have seasons varying generally from um, May through September or October. The, the different regions, it's hard to see in this table, but the, the different regions are kind of highlighted in alternating colors here. So some, some states are their own region and then there's a, a couple uh, multi-state regions. So um, harvest and discards since 2009 are, are shown in this figure. And harvest in terms of the number of pounds has generally been uh, declining in recent years since about 2013. 2022 harvest in pounds shown in the, the top line there was uh, estimated to be 8.63 million pounds last year. That was an uptick a little bit from 2021, which was one of the lowest harvest estimates in pounds that we've observed in the time series. Uh, this figure also, also shows dots on the end for estimated preliminary harvest through wave four of 2023. And so far in 2023, about 6.96 million pounds or million pounds of summer flounder have been harvested. And that represents about 66% of the harvest limit for this year. Last year in numbers of fish, about 3.38 million fish were harvested. And so far in 2023, 2.62 million fish have been harvested. Um, dead discards are shown from the management track assessment series. And that is in the, the gray line there that's been uh, fairly steady or uh, somewhat decreasing in recent years. Over the last five years for summer flounder, the percent of harvest in weight estimated to come from state waters has averaged about 72%, 28% from federal waters. By mode, about 84% of the harvest in weight has been taken uh, from the private rental fishery in recent years with about 5% estimated to come from party charter uh, fleet and 11% from shore. So getting into the, the percent change approach, this is the, the general table. I'm just gonna kind of talk about this as a reminder and as an overview of what the percent change approach does. So just to recap, this was used for the first time to set 2023 measures, and this was implemented uh, as the result of that harvest control rule framework and addenda. So it, this approach uses a combination of projected harvest under current measures. Uh, compared to the upcoming RHL or average RHL, and also in combination with that biomass relative to the target. 
and those things determine the necessary change in harvest for the upcoming uh, year or years. And so again, after 2023, measures are now going to be set for two years at a time going forward. So the evaluation here in the first column would be relative to the two-year average RHL. So we take projected harvest under current measures and apply an 80% confidence interval. And that 80% that uh, is based on the recommendations of the Monitoring and Technical Committee. And then depending on where the RHL falls relative to that confidence interval, you end up in one of the three rows in that first column of this table. And then column two is based on the most recent assessment information, which we now expect to be updated uh, every other year for these species. So you could fall into uh, low, high, and very high uh, stock biomass categories, depending on where the biomass estimate falls relative to the target. And then column three gives you the resulting change in harvest that you need for uh, the, the upcoming year. And that change in harvest is, re is relative to that estimate in column one of uh, expected harvest under current measures. So I'll walk through the application of this approach for summer flounder in the, the next few slides. Uh, but before getting too into the details of that, I do want to just recap a bit where we are with the 2024 and 2025 RHL for summer flounder and why it is so much lower than the 2023 RHL. As a reminder about the, the reductions that we are facing in the, the catch limits. So back in August, the council and the board reviewed the 2023 management track assessment and adopted a 2024 and 2025 RHL of 6.35 million pounds. And that represents a 40% reduction in the RHL from this year's RHL of uh, 10.62 million pounds. So uh, just to kind of quickly recap um, why we're, we're facing those reductions. It, it, back in August, we talked about this was sort of the monitoring committee's comments on, on the discussion regarding stock status and why the limits are uh, decreasing to this extent. The 2023 management track assessment showed overfishing was occurring in 2022, despite recent underages of the ABCs and OFLs. The limits uh, in this fishery have, have not, uh, for the most part, been reached in the, the last few years. Uh, this is basically because the projections from the previous management track appear to have been over-optimistic. There's a bit of a retrospective pattern in the assessment of overestimating biomass and underestimating fishing mortality, which was compounded by adding three years of data at a time. Um, there was an over-optimistic estimation of the 2018 year class, and then there have been some changes in productivity for summer flounder uh, observed in the assessment, including declining mean length and weights at age for both sexes, declining maturity at age, and a recent 12 year period of low but stable recruitment. So this is just sort of a reminder that there's some stock status uh, issues that led to uh, a large cut in the, the OFL and then the resulting catch limits for this fishery. And that's kind of why we got to this um, harvest limit for 2024 and 2025. That's uh, substantially lower than what we have this year. So the first step in the percent change approach application is this column one comparison of the 2024, 2024 RHL to that 80% confidence interval around the um, harvest estimate under current measures. So based on um, estimates from the recreation demand model that we received on the current set of regional measures, the uh, median estimate was 8.88 million pounds and the confidence interval is 8.1 to 9.48 million pounds. That confidence interval, as uh, Lou mentioned, is entirely above the uh, upcoming RHL. So we end up in this last box in column one. And then <clears throat> summer flounder uh, biomass relative to the target is in the low category. So the, the target is below or the biomass is below target stock size. And that means we end up in a reduction uh, of the percent of the difference between the harvest estimate and the RHL not to exceed 40%. So sometimes the um, recreational accountability measures, if they are triggered, can factor into the resulting harvest target. So I just want to point out quickly that the recreational accountability measures for summer flounder have not been triggered. As I mentioned, we've been under the limits in uh, this fishery and for the rec fishery that includes being under the ACL in 2021 and 2022. So the average ACL for the last three years was not exceeded. So no accountability measures to deal with for summer flounder. Uh, meaning we can just look at the harvest target for the next two years as the difference between the harvest estimate and the RHL not to exceed 40%. So we have 
harvest estimate under current measures of 8.88 million pounds. And that basically means we reduce it down to the harvest limit of 6.35 million pounds, and that's a 28% reduction in harvest. So the monitoring committee met um, the, actually twice. So I'll talk about their kind of their combined recommendations from their November 13th and 14th meeting, as well as a, a, an additional call we held on December 7th. So the monitoring committee recommended continuation of regional conservation equivalency for summer flounder in the next two years using the same regions. Um, again, uh, the combination of regional measures would then be designed to achieve that harvest target and achieve that coastwide 28% reduction. So the non-preferred coastwide measures, this is where the, the monitoring committee had to discuss this on a second call because at the time of the first call, we didn't have the information from the RDM to inform our recommendations on this. So um, the monitoring committee ultimately recommended non-preferred coastwide measures, including 18 and a half inch size limit, three fish bag limit, and a May 8th to September 30th season. So this is uh, sort of a reminder that in the past, the non-preferred coastwide measures have been pretty difficult to analyze. It, it had been so long since we had had coastwide measures that we had really limited information to go on to assess their impacts. And now we have the RDM, so that's been a useful tool to sort of see what the um, potential impacts of, of coastwide measures might be. We did several runs prior to the uh, December 7th monitoring committee meeting to sort of inform uh, what those might look like. Those are, are described in that uh, the appendix to that supplemental monitoring committee summary. But basically, we're, we were tweaking the size limit and the season until we got to um, run coastwide five, uh, that highlighted down in the bottom, which is the recommendation that achieves a 30 percent um, reduction compared to the current regional uh, measures harvest. Um, we kind of explored, you know, initially a set, a set of measures that ended up being way too overly restrictive and uh, then went up to 18 and a half inch size limit and uh, then uh, tried to tweak the season from there to get uh, close to that 28 percent. So the monitoring committee supported this recommendation uh, for these non-preferred coastwide measures and also recommended status quo precautionary default measures, including two fish, 20 inches, and uh, July 1st, to August 31st season, indicating that these are likely to still be sufficiently re restrictive in all states. Obviously, a set of very restrictive measures no state would want to put in place. And we did also note that the RDM, the first RDM run we did for coastwide measures was 19 inches, three fish, May 25th to August 31st, and that resulted in a 54% reduction. Um, we don't need to achieve any particular reduction with these uh, precautionary default measures, but it did just kind of put that in context a little bit that the, the precautionary default measures are currently a lot more restrictive than that and definitely would result in a substantial reduction. So the moderate committee was comfortable leaving those as is. Moving on to the advisory panel comments on recreational measures. Uh, clearly, many advisors were concerned and frustrated with the 28% reduction needed. So a um, couple different comments on this. One advisor noted Magnuson requires socioeconomic impact analysis, and he was sort of questioning, is this being sufficiently addressed? What kind of impact analysis do we have for this type of reduction? Um, a couple advisors noted that this is particularly going to hurt the for hire industry and associated shoreside businesses, noting that some party charter businesses will go out of business uh, due to a reduction of this magnitude. Um, one advisor said, we really need to know what these regulations are going to be to achieve this, this reduction. Um, clearly, we didn't have any proposed state measures uh, at the time of this meeting. Um, and then another advisor noted that a uh, swing from basically two years ago when we had a 16.5% liberalization for summer flounder to now going to a 28% reduction is uh, feast or famine management. So, you know, some advisors frustrated with the, the swings in, in measures from year to year. Um, but one advisor noted that the, the impacts associated with this type of cut are really amplified by similar reductions or cuts in several other recreational fisheries and, and mentioned striped bass and scup. There were a couple advisors that supported evaluating sector separation, um, being of the mind that this might help 
the poor higher sector avoid large cuts in the future if they were managed using their own reported data instead of um, associated with with the MRIP data. Um, if they were managed separately, it might uh, help help avoid large cuts for the poor higher sector. So um, one advisor noted that a lot of states are are down in harvest this year compared to last, and so. Uh, there was the question of sort of what is this 28% reduction relative to? Do the current year trends factor into the, the regional reduction that's needed? So staff clarified, you know, as, as Lou just described, the RDM is informed by a range of different data sources. And there is some information from the current year, including the, that that informs that average catch per trip um, information. And last year's data is also accounted for in that catch per trip. So it's somewhat accounted for the 28% reduction is relative to the RDM pro projection of harvest under current measures. So it's not necessarily, if you were to compare it to a given region's 2022 harvest, for example, it may not necessarily align completely. It's relative to that projection of harvest under current measures. There was, there was some concern from a couple advisors about setting two year measures, um, especially given the large reduction needed there was a question of is this a required element of the, the percent change approach and you know it, it, as far as staff uh, staff responded you know basically yes this was part of that framework and then just set two-year measures going forward uh, we did have a clarification because there was some confusion that the re reduction is only taken once in 2024 and then measures are would stay the same for between 2024 and 2025 so there would be some um, provide that provides for some stability because at least you know the measures you know, aren't necessarily going to change in 2025. Um, so there was one recommendation for considering different measures by mode. Uh, this individual was a, a shore fisherman noting that shore fishing is very different uh, with pretty limited seasonal shore access and that and consideration of different measures by mode would be beneficial for the summer ponder fishery. Um, two advisors noted opposition to any increases in size limits and express support for reducing size limits in order to re uh, reduce dead discards. And um, also some concern was expressed about the possible future changes to MRIP based on that recent pilot study, as we discussed in August, um, based on that, the order of questions in the fishing effort survey and the need to um, conduct additional evaluation based on the results of that pilot study and possible changes to MRIP in the future based on that. Um, this advisor stated that the current survey methodology, you know, might be contributing to issues like these large reduct reductions needed and, and essentially said that, that we are understanding now that the current data is flawed and that should be considered in terms of what represents the best available science. There was a question about whether discards are assumed to occur only during the open season or accounted for year round. Um, staff clarified they are estimated and accounted for year round, but this advisor was concerned about um, reporting of, of discards and those being captured um, accurately in our recreational catch accounting methodology. Um, this advisor was also frustrated that managers have not considered a total length limit uh, management for summer flounder in the recreational fishery. And another advisor did speak to this and supported exploration of alternative strategies, such as a total length limit, for example, and also supported um, hook size regulations to reduce discards. We did get a couple comments by email that are also in that um, attached to that AP summary. One advisor noted to achieve a 28% reduction in Delaware, sorry, that's supposed to say Maryland, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, cut the, the bag limit to three fish. Another advisor noted that the yo-yo effect of measures limits increasing and decreasing is demoralizing and also suggested a couple different uh, strategies to address discards of summer flounder and reduced harvest of larger female fish, including changing the commercial, si commercial minimum size limit to 13 inches and then not allowing states to increase the recreational size limits or season length in 2024 and 2025, indicating that both of those things uh, increase discards. This advisor also suggested requiring 7-0 hooks in the rec recreational fishery and then to also try um, experimentally managing solely based on bag limit or total length with no minimum size um, with the stipulation that anglers must stop, fish must stop fishing when the, their limit is reached. So that's it for the AP comments. And then in summary, the 
monitoring committee recommendations are, are here. I can leave those up during the discussion. Uh, conservation equivalency, 28% reduction coastwide with non-preferred coastwide measures, including 18 and a half inches, three fish, May 8th to September 30th, and precautionary default measures, including uh, 20 inches, two fish, July 1st to August 31st. And then um, we have one slide that uh, Chelsea is gonna cover, just talking about the regional approach in state waters. Yes, so if we continue to go with conservation equivalency, this is just a reminder for the board that per addendum 32, uh, summer flounder recreational measures must be developed using the six region approach, and these are static regions, they can't change. Uh, where measures for all states within a region must consist of the same minimum size, possession limit, and season length. And as a reminder to the board, because this is the first time that we would be setting two-year measures, uh, when states submit their proposals, they should include their season dates for both 2024 and 2025. Um, and so those six summer flounder regions are one, Massachusetts, two, Rhode Island, three, Connecticut through New York, four, New Jersey, five, Delaware through Virginia, and then six, North Carolina. Um, so state measures will be proposed and approved through the commission process. And just to give a brief overview of the timeline of, for how that will work this year, we're going to ask for final state proposals from the technical committee by mid-January, which would allow for a board meeting to happen around mid-February, the second week of February. Um, and we'll reach out to you all this week to get that meeting on the calendar so that we can get those state measures approved, again, if conservation equivalency is preferred. And that's all I have, so we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, I Questions for Kylie or Chelsea? Questions? Any comments to them? Mike? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this may be a question, but maybe also for, for some thought if it's not currently uh, defined. So I re I'm trying to remember back, there were times in the past when we had to take what I, a, a similar reduction to this, which I would consider to be rel pretty significant. Um, it's not an easy charge. And there have been times in the past where states have gone back and pr produced conservation equivalency plans with one with one thing in mind and let's say that's increasing the minimum size limit to a, to accomplish the entire reduction um, we found ourselves and this is probably 10 12 maybe even further back than that 15 years ago where our minimum size limits just became I mean, I remember New York, I think, might have had a 21 or a 22 inch minimum size limit for summer flounder, and it was a cause of a lot of controversy and problems. Uh, we, we revisited that over time, and again, correct me if I'm steering off course here, but we corrected that by allowing states to visit the different levers that we have to pull for, as managers, but only assigning certain portions of the overall reduction to those to those levers. So to accomplish a 30% reduction or a 28% reduction, you'd have to split that out between size limit, bag limit, and season. You weren't able to just accomplish it all in one under one measure. Is it are any of those is I see some heads nodding, so I I'm not remembering a dream or something that I had, you know, a long time ago, but is that still somewhat in in place or if when states leave here to go back to craft these rules is everything just is the door wide open because my thought would be we want to have a discussion about how we do craft those conservation equivalency measures so we don't find ourselves back in the position that we were a decade ago and just revisiting the past um commission staff might have input on this as well, but I, yeah, I, I do remember 
the last time we were facing a reduction of this magnitude, I think there was a, a joint a, a, a vote at this meeting or an agreement to increase the size limits by one inch across the board. So there have been discussions like that, and that's sort of why I indicated on the um, objective side, there can be a discussion today about setting parameters for how to adjust state measures. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so the board can give direction to the technical committee on how, you know, I guess what the preferred way to achieve the reduction is if they would like to see, you know, an increase in size limit first, and then the technical committee can focus on that when they start the RDM runs to see what the reduction would be. And then, you know, in conversation with the state managers, what the resulting reduction is from those little tweaks. I think the RDM makes that this process a lot easier because we can change one thing at a time, add a few days, subtract a few days, and see what the results are and work from there. Um, so it's really up to the board and those regions to go to their technical committee members and I guess have a discussion about what how they would like to see that 28% reduction. And I don't know if Tony has anything to add here. But I'll just say, Mike, that if the board wants every state to do something, then that should be discussed here today and decided upon so that the TC has those bounds now um, rather than trying to make that decision in February when we try to approve proposals. Mike. Okay, so, uh, thanks for that. And so I think that that's, that's the second part of my question was whether or not you need the specific details now. So I, I guess this, the way I'm seeing it, we decide on and we, we approve the reduction that's needed and then we step into the, the realm of deciding how the states are going to address that. And that's today. So some of that discussion will occur today. And then Tony, did you say that the, so at the winter meeting of ASMFC, this isn't planned for that, right? This would be a, is it a virtual? Because I looked on their, on your agenda and it, this board's not meeting that week. Our meeting's too early this year to review proposals. I don't think that we can get finished in time. So we're going to have this virtual meeting that Chelsea speaks of. We will doodle, pull the board to figure out what the best date is in February. We're hoping to do it mid-February though, um, outside of the council meeting. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry if I missed that during your presentation. I, I was trying to, I was gathering information from a number of different sources. So thank you. Any more questions or comments? Uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this question is direct to Kylie, I guess, because I'm just curious, the AP, the comment came up again about a uh, combined total length of your fish. And I know that's come up time and time again. And since we will be looking at changes to regulations, uh, can you just refresh why that has not been an acceptable uh, way to meet the reductions in the past? And I'm guessing now. Sure, I, it's been, uh... It's been talked about, I mean, you know, as you mentioned, a lot from the advisory panel comments. Uh, we've talked about it at the, at the monitoring committee level a few times and frequently raised it with the council and board. There's been, um, the, the primary concern is um, enforceability and then kind of the desire of anglers to have a, a system like that and whether high grading would occur. Um, just there's been a couple different concerns, but I think that the primary one is enforceability and then um, managing kind of, you know, particularly on a on a party boat or something, managing, you know, measuring and, and keeping track of the total length of fish uh, seems to be a little complicated. Those have been some of the comments that have made um, on this in the past. And I think it was also discussed, at least um, preliminarily, in the, the summer flounder MSC for that a uh, couple years back for the recreational measures. And it didn't it didn't make it into the the final um, measures options, but it was discussed by that working group, I believe. Just curious, is there any way to evaluate how much of a reduction in catch something like that would generate? I, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I, I think it's 
it's possible. It would probably be fairly complicated. I mean, I don't think it's something we could do with the with the RDM right now. It's something that would require a lot of assumptions, and you could probably generate some kind of ballpark. But I, uh, I'm not quite sure how you do that. I would have to think about it. Nicola. Thank you. Yes, um, a question to Chelsea. You mentioned that states should submit their seasons for both 2024 and 2025. So that leads me to conclude that there is some flexibility for states to have a slightly different season length in year two, such as to maintain, you know, opening on a Saturday, for example. But the process would be to have measures in 2024 that would take the 28% cut and then using the RDM have measures in 2020 five that would be conservationally equivalent to that in terms of harvest for but with a different slightly different season is that correct uh yes that's correct and so uh because the fmp says season length we you can like you said if you were on it to stay open on a saturday in 2024 and 2025 states can submit that if it is the same length and if the rdm can prove that it is conservationally equivalent in both of those years and we still need to check to make sure that Lou can run for 2025. If he can't, then the measures will have to be the same for 2024 and 2025. Tuesday start date or set like no matter what, if that model, if it can't run it. But the number of days has to stay the same. Scott Lennox. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kai, thanks for the presentation. Um, can you jump back to slide 22? I think it was 22. It's back in the AP comments. I just want to be able to read it again. Yeah. So this is this is this is what concerns me as well. When I when I saw this come by, I think whoever made this, and it might have been more than one person. I think whoever made this comment. As a really valid point, um, question that came up to mind was hypothetically, this fishing ever survey question uh, that we've got coming from Emrip, where they've said it could be off by thirty or forty percent. If that had happened six months ago and it's adjusted, are we looking at a twenty-eight percent reduction in this fishery? Yeah, so you're saying, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can answer that. It's, so we don't know, you know, exactly what the impacts of, it, you know, because this was just a pilot study, we don't fully know what the impacts would be, and we don't know what the impacts would be specific to summer flounder catch estimates and how that would affect the RDM. Okay, that's fair. Thank you, John Hare. Yeah, thank you. I think it's also important to remember that if we change the catch going into the assessment, the assessment is going to change. Um, so you have the, you know, does it change your catch level? Maybe. Is it going to change the assessment? Maybe. So there's the two steps there that changes in the fishing effort survey will have. Any more question or comments? Mike Wayne, we'll go out the audience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association. I, this was timely because I wanted to ask about this slide specifically. And you can imagine there's <clears throat> a lot of concern by the recreational fishing industry that we're taking a 28% reduction in this fishery that's going to have real economic impacts on the fishery and its anglers and the industry that supports that activity. And yet we've got this uncertain MRIP situation that we've kind of just been ignoring because we don't have more information to provide at this time. So I'm struggling communicating with our membership regarding what is coming, what is happening. All we've heard is that there's going to be a follow-up study is there any guidance 
I think some of the managers when this came out were saying, how do we do our job? Are we just ignoring that this is happening? Is there information that the agency can share that help managers make decisions with this type of uncertainty that got inserted into the process? And are is no fisheries working on that guidance? Because this isn't going away anytime soon and we're facing these very real economic impacts of these decisions, even though we know that it's based on information that we're not even really all that confident in. Let me simplify. Is the agency working on guidance? The yes or no. I think to the extent that you're asking for how the council and the commission should continue to manage the recreational fisheries, there is no specific guidance. Keep doing what you're doing. The the issue, you know, we've talked about the the question order, the the effort survey a number of times. We did a pilot study that showed there may be a, an estimation effect of the, the order of the questions. The pilot study was not specific, as Kylie just said. It wasn't specific to species, wasn't specific to state. And so the inferences that one might draw from, you know, how we should manage summer flounder, we don't have any information on which to say that we're doing anything wrong. The, the expanded survey that's going to take place in 2024 should help us understand whether there's a specific issue for summer flounder, black sea bass, or scup. And if so, how much of an effect may that have had, not only on our estimate of wreck catch, but as John Hare said, but on the assessment as well. And all of that needs to happen before we can conclude whether there's an actual issue for a particular species, particular state, uh, particular, particular fishery. So is that, has that timeline been laid out? Like, we just hear that there's a study coming, but there hasn't been a ton of transparency regarding what that process looks like, what, the time, what, what actually is being conducted. So I think the point I'm trying to make here, Mr. Chairman, and to the council is, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Regional Administrator Penny but the rec sector has a lot of questions. So more transparency from the agency on this issue, I think would be helpful. Captain Victor. One thing, I, the first question I have to ask is on the AP meeting, we had a discussion we're going out two years for these measures. So now does that mean it was my understanding on the AP meeting that we're not taking a 28% cut over two years, we're taking a 14% cut every year for the two years. So it's 28% over the two years, not 28% for 24 and 28 for 25, because that's a huge difference. And one of the problems I have every year I come here, and I'm gonna say this now, Every, I go out to everybody and ask before these meetings what they think, what they want, what problems we're having. MRFs is a problem. If the agency doesn't see it by everything, there's a lot of doctors here. I'm not that smart, but I'm on the water every day. You guys need to put together a committee to get a better way of managing this fishery where not only am I going to be out of business, there's going to be tackle shops out of business. We can't come back here every year and say MRF's data is off like 40% or this, but we know party boats do 5%. This is why the four higher ones scepter separation, because we do reports every single day, every single day, whether they, and if you go with a per length limit, which is, I kind of brought that up. I was the only one on my party boat. I'll manage that because guess what that does? No more dead discards because I'm not throwing anything back until I get my limit. 
And then I'm quitting and I go home, which is what I do for straight bass. When we get our limit, we go home. I don't stay there and catch a hundred. We're destroying striped bass right now because you can't, they're kind of like sea bass. We can't get away from them. Well, you guys don't see this because, and the one thing I, I looked at Massachusetts, they have the best regs. Five fish at 16 and a half inches. The state that catches the biggest fluke. We lose more customers to Massachusetts because they want the monster fluke from Georgia's banks. But they've got the best regs at 16 and a half inches and five fish. Why is that? I'd like to know because I think we should go back in size so we have led less dead discards because we're getting blamed for them. But Murph's dad, if you guys don't, somebody near needs to make a motion to get some committee together with rec for hire, all the smart people with doctorate's degrees and come up with a better system because Murph's dad, it hasn't changed since I've been coming to these meetings for the last at least 10 years. I'm learning more, but that's the problem and nobody trusts it. No one trusts it. I mean, my question is really the 14%. Are we taking a 28% cut for the next two years? Or are we taking a 14% cut every year? Because we got regulations for two years. Is it 28% over two? Or is it 28% every year for the next two? It'll be 28% and then it'll stay the same for the following year. So we're taking two cuts. Well, you're taking or, one cut, but it'll be for two years. Right, so if we have a, that makes no sense because then you're getting penalized for two years. It doesn't. And people don't understand it. That's why they don't trust you guys. They don't. And if you don't do something about MRFs, they're never going to trust you. They ask me why, it doesn't matter. They, they ask me why I come to the meeting, but it's kind of like voting for the president. If you don't voice your opinion, then don't complain. But, Tony? Yep. I can try. I, I think we have to remember with recreational measures that we don't have a hard quota, so you're not, you, you, don't, you can't measure in the same way that we do the commercial fishery. And we're setting regulations that we think are going to achieve the RHL. So we're not, you know, making somebody pay back something for it, in that way like you do when you have an overage in the commercial fishery. It's just you're creating a set of measures that you think is going to achieve the RHL in the next year. And relative to last year, that is a cut for the coming year, but it's not multiple cuts going forward. It's just the measures that we think will achieve that RHL, or we estimate will achieve it. Rick Bellavance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess kind of adding on to this discussion, because there does seem to be a bit of confusion. I'm a little confused as to what happens with the 2024 fishery performance, right? So we set, the model comes up with a set of, um, well, the states present a set of measures, the model analyzes it, they get a projection of what they think the harvest is going to be. And then once we get through preliminary data for 2024, it shows that that wasn't right. We were under harvest or over harvest. So, like, uh, I, if I understand it right, there's no flexibility to change the measures in 2025. So, if the model was a little off and, and had an under projection or over projection, we're going to have we're going to have that again in the next year. And will that lead to an even bigger penalty or a bigger liberalization in 2026? Like, it, there's just so much uncertainty. I'm trying to just make sure I'm clear. Allie. Yeah, so the, the review process for the two year measures, I think, we're still trying to, to work out the details somewhat, but I, I think that the intent of it was that it would be kind of similar to when we set multi year specifications where there is a process for the council and, and the various advisory groups to review information and basically only make a change if there is a suggestion of something extreme going on, you know, some something that indicates um, you know, something way different than what we expected. And, you know, we go through our process of reviewing the, when we go through the ABC process, we have the SSC look at it and, you know, say um, whether or not there, there is a need to change things. But I think that's the expectation that it would be very unlikely 
that we would change things in 2025 unless there is some indication that something is going totally off the rails. Rick. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. It's helped clarify things quite a bit. I'm in favor of the multi-year specs. I think that's great for stability for our businesses and so on. I just don't want to end up having to pay the piper twice as bad in 26 or, or forego a, a potential liberalization either. So I think there's room if something crazy happens, but in general, we're going to keep them steady. I think I got it. Thanks. Thank you. John here. Thank you very much. I'm um, going back to Mr. Wayne's question. Um, the agency has posted information, more information about the update to the FES survey, um, the timeline for the calibrated time series of catch and effort estimates sort of rescaled to the revised design is it sort of thought in terms of end of the 20 year 2025 estimates. So it'd be available in mid April 2026. Um, and then the earliest that the new survey would be implemented if warranted would be 2026. And so we'll be working on that, you know, plan potential changes in FES and start thinking about how to line that up with our assessments. And I'll share the web page with you, um, Chris, so you can share it with the council. Thank you. Tom Foti. My name is Tom Foti. I'm here representing the Jersey Coast Anglers Association and the New Jersey State Federation of Sportsmen Clubs. When I first walked in the room today, I thought, who is here? And we started doing this besides me in the early 80s, late 80s and early 90s. And the only person who's sitting directly across me is Chris Moore. <coughs> Excuse me. I've seen a lot over the last 40 years sitting at meetings, and it's not been good. I started off as Tri Bass. My public comments at the uh, Stripe Bass, actually in person meeting in New Jersey, by saying, I'm sorry I lied to you all these years. Because I told you in the 90s and even in the 2000s, if you suffered pain, you were going to get a reward, both commercially and recreationally. And just the opposite has happened in the last 30 years. We have stocks that were bigger than they were 30 years ago. Yet we have, and we have black sea bass, is double the size of the target. We have that. And what do we see? We see pain. And as Mike said, and a young man from New Jersey, I call him a young man even though he's old, but he's a lot younger than I am, that we have lost the trust of the public. Truly, we have lost the trust of the public. They don't believe you. They don't trust the figures you put out. Then you back off. You tell them, oh, it's going to be, we might have 40% wrong figures, but you're going to have to wait three years. Well, you don't have to suffer for three years. We have to suffer. As recreational anglers, charter boat captains, and commercial fishermen. All three of us are in the same bag. And we used to stay together more and fight together, but it stopped over the years. But it's just tough. And I can't lie to the public anymore. I call as I see it. We're not doing a good job of managing fisheries. I remember meeting in New York that Jimmy Lovegren and the Garden State Seafood Show, and they had its t shirts on them. It said, 20, uh, it was the uh, celebration of 25 years of NIFS managing fisheries. It says, and this has been destroying the fisheries for 25 years. Well, I guess we could have numerous T-shirts saying that they, because we have not shown them any light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, there is no light right now. And it's not all our fault. I mean, we could never uh, anticipated that global warming would affect the, the bays and the estuaries, affect the young and what happens to them all. But we never give any real, real hope to the recreational commercial, the commercial fisheries. I mean, they're just sitting there saying, well, you listen, so what's happened now is everybody's breaking the law. Maybe not everybody. There's a few people like me. I know Paul Hartel, who, who's an ex-cop, says, I can't do that. But there's a lot of people out there because they just see us throwing dead fish over dead fish, whether it's black sea bass, striped bass, and summer flounder, and just the discards are now more than we're taking home. I mean, and that's when it's really become shame. We're basically, striped bass is 51% of the mortality for both the recreational and the commercial fisheries. And the same thing, summer flounder, the numbers are great. There never used to be a high discard number with summer flounder, because people took home and were allowed to take home. I mean, we thought it was gonna be bad when it was, we went from 10 fish, to, uh, from zero bag limit to 10 fish at 14, 10 fish at 16, 10 fish, four fish at 18. As we progressed up, 
So it's only gotten worse. I don't know what, what you can tell the public, but there is no trust, there's no support for NIMS anymore out there from the public, and they just feel feel pain and pain. And I'm sorry to rant, Lorraine, but it's good to like, attend a meeting. It's been an interesting year, me health-wise, so I haven't been able to do any of these meetings, but it's good, like you need to get your tooth pulled once in a while, and a little ice on it to make you feel a little pain. But thank you for all your hard work. I understand you're sitting here trying to do the best you can, but the public doesn't understand it, and truthfully, I can't understand it. We, I'm, spending, I'm on Mayfac now. We're spending a lot of time in coastal resiliency and fisheries. I've probably spent 20 meetings this year alone talking about that. I said, what are you going to do? Tow icebergs down to the oh, icebergs down to uh, Jamaica Bay or Cape Cod? And they're, oh, wait a minute, icebergs are all gone. So are the glaciers. I mean, we, there's other factors coming involved in what we're doing, and yet we don't seem to get that word out to the public that it's just not us. And you always, I know you, all you can do is represent, regulate the recreation of the commercial sector, but we're not the ones causing the problems anymore. There's a hell of a lot of problems that we have caused outside our realm, but we're the only ones taking the hit on it. Again, thank you very much for your time. Jim Fletcher. Jim, we can't hear you. Would you like to try it again? Still can't hear you, Jim. So we're going to move on. If you think you get it figured out, put your, raise your hand again and we'll try you again. Kyla, you have a motion that you can put up. Yep. Or Stephen has a motion. Once everybody gets a chance to read the motion, would anybody like to entertain this motion? Justin Davis for the council, I mean for the commission. John Clark, what council, commission, both? One second, one motion. <laughs> I guess I can make the motion for the council and second for the board. Do we have a second for the council? Mike Lisi. Any discussion on the motion? Peter Hughes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's, if this two-year specification package that we're putting together, the motion says that this is going to be a reduction in 2024. It doesn't include 2025, um, if that's the intended intent of the motion. Um, and it, it's got to follow through. Uh, same thing with the precautionary default measures. When 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 does that begin? We need a time start. Is that you know, January 1st or July 1st, uh, 2026? Uh, those default measures would fall into place if we didn't have any a specs package or uh, RHL uh, measures in place. So that's the two things that I see in this motion. I think I'd say I'm not a real fan of uh, multi-year um, spec setting, especially in a fishery as volatile as this. Um, you know, I did hear some explanation earlier that if there is something um, that we can possibly address measures again in 2025, but um, I've been involved in 
multi-year spec setting fisheries and other fisheries, um, especially the scallop fishery. And we have a really hard time projecting that second year out. Um, and uh, it took years for us to change that to a, a, a annual spec setting. Um, but since we've done that, huh, I'm not going to say we're better at it, but it's 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 we've eliminated a lot of uncertainty in that second year. Um, so, but uh, I will uh, I will go with the motion. Thank you. Michael Easy. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thanks. I, I may just ask as a point of order um, if Ms. Uh, Dr. Davis would perhaps, since he was the first to put his hand up, maybe read the motion into the record so we're all clear as to what it is that we're discussing. And for folks who are on the phone or maybe listening in, to know what we're talking about. Thanks. Justin, would you like to read into the minutes? Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Uh, move to adopt regional conservation equivalency for 2024-2025 summer flounder recreational management. The harvest target is equal to the 2024-2025 RHL of 6.35 million pounds based on the application of the percent change approach and the recreation demand model harvest projection, which results in a 28% coastwide harvest reduction to be taken in 2024. Non-preferred coastwise measures include an 18.5 inch minimum size, three fish possession limit, and open season from May 8th to September 30th. Precautionary default measures include a 20 inch minimum size, two fish possession limit, and open season from July 1st to August 31st. And the board will have the first crack at this. First, to, to clarify one of the questions that was raised, the intent of the motion, as I understand it, is that as we discussed, the 28% cut is taken in 2024, and then it's status quo measures for 2025, which I think was one of the questions that uh, Peter just raised. Um, and and what, there was another question about the non-preferred coastway measures. I think Mr. Penny was going to respond to that. Thanks. Right. So the, the, uh, the coastwide, the non-preferred coastwide measures are what gets put in the regulations, which and then are then they're then waived under the conservation equivalency uh, program once we approve conservation equivalency. So, typically in a year like, um, say, twenty the beginning of twenty twenty four, until we publish our final rule, technically the coastwide measures are what apply in federal waters. Once we approve conservation equivalency, then those measures are waived. So we implement the, if we implement the proposed non-preferred coastwide measures, they go on the books in 2024, but they're waived. But then they're what's on the books on January 1, 2025, except that if we're doing two-year specs, we will have effectively waived them on January 1st. And it's probably a much cleaner system because then there's not a point in time in which the regs to which you are subject change in the middle of the year. That probably doesn't clarify anything, but that's kind of the way the system works. Right. Thank you, Mike. Um, is there further discussion on the motion from the board? Adam Nowalski? Yeah, thank you. So. There is obviously much pain and angst in the recreational community here today. I think when you go back to August and we looked at the overall cuts to the quotas, there was equal, if not more, angst in the commercial industry looking at the 40% reduction in the quota and a 40% reduction in the recreational harvest limit. If you took this in a vacuum and were to say, well, you've got a 40% reduction in your quota, but you need a 28% reduction in your change in measures. In a vacuum, a lot of people would walk away with that and say, hmm, okay, that's not so bad. I think when you look at MRIP, and I certainly have as many questions about it as anybody, and you recognize that it goes into the stock assessment and you realize that 
Well, if our catch is lower, then our allowable catch limits are probably going to be lower as well. So there's some relativity there, takes away some of the angst. What hurts the recreational community the most today and where the pain is felt the most is when they see these measures and recognizing that we've made strides, we see this RDM model, we see a change in our approach, multiple year measures, We've made strides, but the damage has been done seemingly so irreparably over the past two decades that the place we're making changes from now are so completely unpalatable. 28% reductions from 18 plus inch size limits, knowing what we know in the past that you had states at 20 plus inches, we can't go back there. The resource can't go back there. So that's where the real angst lies. And I hope, and I, I've said this before, and I hope as we move forward, we can potentially look at recognizing this new process that's in place, recognize that we're learning about MRIP, that we can recognize the decisions we've made in the past, probably weren't the best, and we can go back and say, well, if we did some reset in measures here, that was both good for the resource and took into account what we've done wrong in the past, that there would be merits in doing that. So I think that's all I want to walk out of here again with today is reiterating that message that I hope is a deliberative body. We can look at some point in the future, the ability to recognize we're changing the process, recognizing it's not perfect. A lot of damage has been done. And if there's some way we consider undoing some of that and moving forward from there, I think that would be something that would help towards regaining the trust we're hearing about that's been lost in ourselves, as well as getting back to a place that's better for the resource, as well as the utilization of it. Thank you, Adam. Um, I do think that it's inherent in some of the other um, recreational setting measure process options that we would be looking at where we start from for those types of measures. So I, I believe there will be more on that discussion moving forward. Um, is there additional discussion from the board on this motion? Progressed. Just for clarity, based on comments from we've heard on the AP and we've heard today inside the motion where reduction to be taken in 2024, Consideration from the motion makers if we shouldn't make that very clear to be taken in 2024 and continued into 2025 to make it ex, you know explicitly clear what this is doing. Because I can read this and still find a way to misinterpret it. And then we and we have heard it from the AP and we've heard it today about clarity and want to be very clear what we're doing here for their they the they have to relate this back to their groups. So I'll offer that up as if nothing else, a friendly amendment. Yeah, I, I, th I think that given the discussion and uh, ongoing source of confusion about that, if, if the maker and seconder of the motions are willing to, Tony, it's waving our hand, I say take that as a friendly emo <laughs> amendment to, to clarify. The reduction, the measures are continuing into 20. 25. The reduction is taken in 2024, and it's relative to the 2023 measures. So if you add 2025, then you will be taking an additional reduction if the way it's worded in the motion, and that is not what we are doing today. So you don't want to add that additional language. I think it's clear here that it's saying you are adopting measures for 2024 and 2025, and it is a 28% reduction taken in 2024, and your measures continue into 25. Is that clear enough for the record? Tony's very convincing. <laughs> All right, we'll keep it as is then. Any uh, further discussion on the motion? We can always make it very clear in, in the meeting summary, the, the intent as well. Is there a need to caucus 
Yes, I'm seeing a hand for our caucus. We'll take a two minute caucus on the motion. Thank you. Is the board ready to vote? All right, we'll begin with the board vote. Um, all those in favor on the board, please uh, raise your hand online. Online, I'm gonna count online, yep. Oh, okay, we'll include Connecticut in the vote then. Tony, you'll help me with this? One second. Nicola, do you want me to read out the states or? Uh, yes, please. Count? Okay. Um, I'm just going to give it one second to settle here. I have Rhode Island, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, New Jersey, New York, NOAA Fisheries, and Justin, you do not have your hand up, correct? You just physically, uh, all right, and Connecticut. <laughs> and, and Maryland, Tony. I said Maryland. Oh, I'm sorry. That's 11, Nick. That's 11 in favor. Lower your hands. Any opposition to the motion? Please raise your hand. Mike, you have your hand up online. <laughs> Anyway, all right, no opposition, any abstentions? 
Seeing none, any null votes? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. On to the council. Would all council members that are in favor of the motion please raise your hand on the computer? We have 18 in favor. Any opposition to the motion? Everyone, let me clear by his hands first. All right, everybody's hands are clear. Any opposition to the motion? One, two, no, whoops. All right, you're off there now. Well, now you're back on. All right. Good, right? Yeah. One opposition. Any abstentions? Put your hand down, Scott. Any opposition? Motion passes 18 1 to 0. Okay, so as, as part of the discussion that started earlier regarding um, how a coastwide 28% reduction is taken, um, we could have some board discussion now if there is interest in any direction to the regions about um, measures or any other considerations, any other, other motions to come before the board on this topic. Mike Lucy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I brought some things up earlier and we heard from the public. I thought the public did a nice job commenting. Um, and I've been sitting here with a smile on my face, face most of the day just because I'm not in one of the chairs to my right, which I've been sitting in for a very long time. Um, but I do think that from what I what I heard today and with some review of our history in this fishery and you know the fluctuate the fluctuations that we've seen over the years I think we're at a point now I, I don't know about anyone else but I'm I'm there's a frustration generate growing inside because we I feel like we continually discuss and debate the way that we should as managers be moving forward. However, what ends up happening, and I think this is human nature for the most part, we come up with a strategy or a plan, but that strategy or, the, or plan is not the path of least resistance. There's, there's going to be some suffering. There's, I heard words like penalization. People, people are gonna feel, people and fishermen should feel the effects of rule changes to the degree of a 30% reduction in, in catch. It, it's not anything that we can dance around and without somebody, without one sector or one group feeling as if they're, they're making a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is not only for the, the, the fish, but it's for their future. If, they're, if their future depends on income generated by this natural resource. So what I, what I would hope is that as we have discussions, and I guess I'll try to focus this to the technical committee, as the technical committee is evaluating um, potential options for us to consider within the regions, I, and I don't, there's, I'm not gonna try to shoot from my hip and come up with any types of percentages here, but if they could keep, if they could keep in mind some form of a structure around the um, 
the reductions and the measures that come from them. Some, some structured discussion about all or nothing as meaning if the path of least resistance is to just increase the minimum size limit by two inches, that's an easy thing to do because you're not influencing access to the resource. You're, you so people can still go fishing and type fishing, fishing trips. You're not gonna bring as many home with you if, you if that's what you choose to do, plan to bring them home to eat. But oftentimes that ends up being the easiest thing to do because you're not affecting access. So what I'd like to see is that the 28% reduction not be forced down any one particular um, lever or uh, better use. Of, we have different tools to manage fisheries. Let's not push that entire 28% down one particular, using one tool, such as increase to minimum size. I think it should be split up so that access and possible changes to minimum sizes could both be a part of that. And maybe we'll find our way, maybe we'll find a place down the road in the future where we start to realize the mistakes that we had made in the past. Let's not do the same thing again. And if we can, if we can balance that sacrifice, um, hopefully the fish will, will um, you know, it'll be a better resource for everyone uh, in the future. There's been a, so much work that's on that's happened, and that we we're at this point now where we uh, you know I feel confident in the work that's been done, and the and the house that we built that we have to live in as far as moving forward. I just hope that that next step in moving forward, when it comes down to the state and regional level, doesn't get us doesn't totally reverse all the good work that's that's happened along the way, and that we find ourselves in a position where we once were uh, years ago. I just don't want to see that happen again. So um, some limitations with the TC, and maybe there could be some way for which each of the different tools that we have could be limited to some degree. So I would suggest maybe a 1% like we had before, one, a one inch minimum size limit change for all states within a region, but nothing more. Anything else in addition to that would need to come off of a season or, or a bag limit so that not everything is forced down into one tool. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that comment, Mike. Uh, um, with, without a, as it stands right now, each region will work um, together, the states and the region will work together to come up with the measures that, that best suit them. There, there aren't any boundaries on it um, unless the motion is made today to, to restrict them is my understanding. So um, I appreciate that comment and hope that states will take it under consideration, but without a specific motion, I wouldn't see that as any type of binding um, guidance to states at this point. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I, I'm not, I don't have enough right now in front of me to try to generate some type of motion to limit states, but I just would like, as you mentioned, that states keep this in mind as they're working with their staff uh, and within the regions um, to try to succeed in the, in the next steps that we take. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and regards to that 28% cut for each region, I believe there may be one more um, motion for the board's um, consideration relative to North Carolina, given their um, special circumstance of their jointly managed flounder um, species. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I did see Roy Miller's hand go up first. So if you wanted to call on him to Mike's point first before I make that motion, um, I'd be willing to uh, hold on for a minute. All right, thank you. I didn't see your hand. Uh, Roy, was your um, response, a question or response to the discussion? I just wanted to comment briefly on what Mike Luisi said, if I could, and then we'll get right to Chris. I just wanted to point out that we've been down this road in the, in the past where we had to um, couple size limit increases for flounder with the uh, seasonal closures. And um, I recall, I just wanted to remind the you know, board and the council of, of our experience with establishing in-season closures before, I think in, in the uh, 
in my long career in association with the commission, it was the most controversial thing we ever tried to do. Uh, and we caught more grief for an in season closure for the very reasons that Mike brought up uh, affecting people's vacations. Why did you have to pick the two weeks or whatever of my vacation? That type of thing. So I, I just want to point that it, it's not a um, not an easy thing for the the angling public to absorb. And and when you basically uh, tell them that they can't go fishing because the season's closed, you, you get a far different reaction than you do when you raise the size limit. Thank you. All right, thank you, Roy. And back to you, Chris. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, motion for people's consideration. Um, Move that uh, each summer finder recreational management region, except for the North Carolina region, so that's uh, i.e. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware through Virginia, take a 20% reduction, harvest reduction using the technical committee recommend, recommended configuration of the recreational demand model to evaluate measures. Measures are subject to board approval prior to implementation. And if I get a second, I'll um, give some background and uh, reason why I'm making this motion. Second by Ray Kane. Go ahead, Chris. All right, thanks. Um, so I'll just quickly say Flander Manage Recreational Flander Management North Carolina is just a wee bit complicated. Um, the uh, North Carolina Southern Flander Fishery Management Plan allows for uh, a recreational flounder season from August 16th through September 30th with one fish bag limit and a 15-inch minimum size limit. And this applies to not only Southern Flounder, but also Summer Flounder and Gulf Flounder. Uh, it also allows for a season from March 1st through April 15th in the ocean for just Summer and Gulf Flounder with that same one fish bag limit and 15-inch minimum size limit. Uh, and this has been in place to reduce fishing mortality and rebuild the Southern Flounder stock. Uh, however, we have these measures, but we've used adaptive management provisions in the Southern Flounder FMP the last couple of years to shorten the season and cancel the spring season to control the harvest of Southern Flounder. Uh, as an example, this year's recreational Flounder season was from September 15th through the 29th. Uh, the short seasons have, have uh, resulted in very low recreational Summer Flounder estimates for North Carolina um, over the last uh, couple of years, especially if you consider compared to what we used to catch. Um, we won't know what our recreational seasons will be in 2024 until early next year. Yes, after wave five and wave six preliminary recreational catch estimates are available since our season was so late in the year. Uh, the recreational demand model decision support tool for North Carolina summer flounder regulations <laughs> that uh, we did showed that the summer flounder harvest estimates are, are the same whether our season is from mid August through September or just the month of September then the harvest estimates are uh, much lower under uh, two week uh, season scenarios. Um, in this motion, it, it states the, the TC will review and recommend and the board will approve region specific regulations at a, at a later board meeting uh, in February. Um, so I think with all this, those steps will uh, ensure that North Carolina's 2024 recreational climate regulations uh, and 25 for that matter uh, will not impact the conservation equivalency measures from achieving a 28% reduction. So in other words, yeah, I think there's going to be some control in place uh, for what we can do. It's already built into this, um, into our Southern Flounder FMP, but it's, uh, uh, you know, our, my, basically my intent is not to you know, jeopardize the coast's ability to meet this 28% reduction by exempting North Carolina from explicitly taking um, a reduction from our already short season. Thanks. All right, thank you, Chris. Is, uh, are there any questions or discussion? Adam Nowalski? So I believe that the expectation is that the current North Carolina regulations for summer flounder are resulting in a catch so far below what they would have because of the Southern flounder regulations anyway. So I am completely sympathetic to this. Uh, I just do want to raise that I suspect that the service now has an easier time in evaluating whether conservation equivalency proposals will in fact constrain the overall harvest to the RHL. For the past two decades, 
commission staff largely have jumped through hoops that I can't imagine the size of to make that argument in many cases. Um, I applaud them in working with the service. Now I suspect it's a case of we're going to plug the numbers into the decision support tool, the RDM. They're going to spit out all of the individual state expected harvest. We're going to add them up as long as it's below the RHL. We're good to go. So my only concern with this is that given that the RDM does use a single baseline MRIF year and not knowing what that might spit out in any given year moving forward, I think it presents the possibility that even though we expect this regulation based on the summer flounder, the southern flounder measures are going to result in a very low summer flounder expected harvest, we may get something different. Um, so I might suggest that an element of this motion include something that says so long as the overall expected harvest is at or below the RHL just to cover ourselves in that event because and I, maybe the service has some answer that yeah we've looked at North Carolina catch for the last 20 years and we have no concern what it is my only concern would be that should we go forward with this all the other states put forward measures and the RDM through the decision support tool spits out a number for North Carolina that results in an exceedance of the RHL, what are we going to do then? Chris, I, I know you use the, um, the model to take a look at differences in North Carolina's harvest, the different regulations. Were, none of them were enough to budge the 28% reduction needed given the small amount of harvest in North Carolina. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. They were actually pretty low. I think in the, like the, the longer seasons were maybe in the 11,000 pound range. Um, but again, yeah, I, I, I hear what uh, Adam is saying um, on that. And I guess the question, I guess, I don't know to make, make this make this murkier is, uh, you know, you're we'll, we doing two year specs. We're going to review them after one year. Um, how do we how do we deal with unforeseen circumstances? Uh, and I guess I would go for this for you know, the regions taking the 20 percent reduction, but in this case specifically for North Carolina, um, you know, if, if if harvest happened to be higher, just you know, based on MRIP, because you do get uncertainty with MRIP, especially with uh, with with shorter seasons. Um, but if 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 the board felt comfortable with you know the um, the kind of the qualifying. Um, language that, that Adam is suggesting. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that as a friendly amendment, but I'll just kind of add that while, I, while the mic's on. Could you repeat what you had in mind again, Adam, to, um, for it was provided the, yeah, I, I had the RHL. Had now I'm just trying to find the best way to put it in here. Um, I guess I'll just go back to what I put out there, provided that the required coastwide reduction is achieved. And the maker. Yeah, and that, that provided part applies to the North Carolina exemption here. Okay, that's clear for the record. Thank you. The maker and seconder are okay. You said you were, Ray? Good. Okay, um, comments on the motion, uh, John Mayles, oh, um, do you mind if I jump to Tony first, Just jumping out of her seat, and then we'll come to you, John, thanks. Can we put a new sentence, say North Carolina's uh, status quo measures are provided that something? It's not necessarily status quo for North oh, Carolina's well, understanding. Uh, yeah. It could North, be slight um, relaxation. Of North the Carolina's measures. exemption? It's an exemption of the 28% reduction. How about that? Is contingent upon the required coastwide reduction being achieved. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Good. 
second, Mike, Aaron, seconder, have had that uh, follow up? Okay. Uh, John Maniscalco? I just wanted to confirm that uh, Chris said the North Carolina harvest, uh, according to the RDM2, was estimated to be 11,000 pounds of a 6.35 million pound RHL. Uh, yeah, that's correct. It's uh, it, it's pretty low, and I think the AMRIP estimates that we had back in 21 and 22 uh, were in the 20 to 27,000 pound range. So uh, it's it's a the, the the one fish bag limit in the short season is uh, is definitely having a quite an impact on on harvest uh, and and probably on fishing behavior too, as far as uh, you know, what what fish and angler chooses to to harvest if they're only allowed to harvest one fish. In other words, they're probably keeping the larger southern flounder and releasing the, the, the smaller keeper summer flounder if, if they have that option to do so. I'll also add that um, this type of exemption has been granted to North Carolina in the past. The year that we did do a one inch increase, um, North Carolina was exempted from that for a very similar type of reason. So um, any further discussion on the motion? I'm going to read the motion into the record, and while I'm doing that, since it's changed, um, while I'm doing that, please caucus if needed, and then we'll move to a vote. So the motion um, is to move that each summer flounder recreational management region, except for the North Carolina region, i.e. Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut to New York, New Jersey, Delaware through Virginia, take a 28% harvest reduction using the technical committee recommended configuration of the recreation demand model to evaluate measures. North Carolina's exemption from the 28% reduction is contingent upon the required coast by reduction being achieved. Measures are subject to board approval prior to implementation. All All right, thank you. Um, all board members in favor of the motion, please raise your, raise your hand online. If, if, you're, if you're online. <laughs> and we'll, we'll just count Tony. I'm seeing 11 in favor. There's some funny hands up. I... Sorry. There's one extra hand up, but. Yeah. I... I have 11, which is everybody in attendance. All right, 11 in favor. Any opposed? Null votes, abstentions, just for the record. There's seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. And as a as brief follow up, um, again, there will be a board meeting um, in February um, where we can um, continue to take public comment on what these measures will be, uh, the board proposals. So um, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, um, seeing as we're behind time. All right, well, still going to take a break, though. OK. Yeah, let's uh, we'll come back at promptly at 350. So 11 minutes.
I'll give everybody a one minute warning. All right, welcome back everyone. Let's go to our final agenda item. We are gonna work on to adopt the 2024, 2025 recreational managers, recreational measures for SCUP. Anna and Chelsea, are you ready? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I recognize that I am what's standing between you and happy hour. So I will go uh, through this rather quickly. Um, so just a reminder, overall objectives for today is to go over recent fishery uh, performance, review the monitoring committee recommendation, as well as input provided by the AP. Um, we will also discuss and identify the percent change needed under the percent change approach, as well as adopt federal waters measures. And if the group desires, um, we could also preliminarily discuss or provide guidance to <clears throat> the technical committee and development of state water measures needed to uh, meet that required uh, change in the harvest. So as you may recall, last year, the percent change approach required a 10% reduction in harvest for SCUP. Um, given, given this required reduction, the council and board adopted modified federal water measures that reduced the possession limit from 50 to 40 fish and reduced the season from a year round open season to an open season from May 1st through December 31st, um, but they maintained the previous 10 inch minimum size limit. Um, they also agreed that given federal water measures alone <clears throat> would not get us the full 10% reduction in harvest, uh, state water measures would also be modified to achieve the remainder 10% through the commission process. Um, so to get at what um, was done through the commission process, so this table shows 2023 measures by state. Um, measures in each state, as I mentioned, were restricted last year, um, and changes implemented really varied by states, but a number of states, mostly from New Jersey North, um, made substantial changes compared to what was in place in 2022. So the next few slides, um, we'll get into some recent recreational harvest trends. Um, on this slide, you can see recreational harvest in both pounds and number of fish, as well as did just dead discards over the past 10 years. Um, we also have preliminary wave one through four 2023 data shown um, by those bullets or those dots on the right hand most side of this graph. Um, and as you can see, preliminary 2023 harvest is about 1.5 million pounds less than the 2019 to 2022 average. So it does appear at least at this point that there has been a decrease in harvest compared to um, previous years wave one through four data. And then looking at general trends of full year data, um, you'll notice that recreational harvest has generally increased over the past 10 years, but dead discards have remained um, relatively constant. For SCUP, we continue to see the bulk of harvest coming from state waters with an average of about 95% uh, of total coastwide harvest based on the most recent five years information. And then this slide um, shows recreational harvest broken down by mode. Um, and if we look at the average uh, for the past five years, about 10% of total harvest is coming from for hire boats, 65% from private rental boats, and 25% from shore. Um, and then this table shows the breakdown of harvest by state uh, since 2018. And as you can see, uh, from year to year, the bulk of harvest is really coming from New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and then to a lesser extent, New Jersey. Um, and then there's limited harvest occurring in states from Delaware South. 
So just as a reminder for setting recreational measures, um, again, for this year, we'll utilize the percent change approach. And as Kylie mentioned, this is the first year where measures will be set for two years in a row. And since Kylie went over this in detail, I won't rehash it. Um, but just to reiterate, this is a three-step process. And I'll go over um, kind of the step-by-step -step for SCUP over the next few slides. Um, so step one is the comparison of average 2024 through 2025 RHL to the 80% confidence interval um, around the expected 2024 through 2025 harvest under current, so 2023 measures. So based on results from the recreation demand model, uh, the median harvest estimate is presented in this table at the bottom of the slide um, is about 15.29 million pounds with a confidence interval ranging from about 16.29 million pounds to 14.07 million pounds. So if we compare that confidence interval range to the average RHL, which is on the right-hand side, about 12.51 million pounds, you'll notice that the average RHL is less than the lower bounds of the confidence interval, and therefore scup, scup similar to summer flounder, falls in the bottom row of column one. So um, same, same situation as summer flounder. So now if we get into steps two and three for the percent change approach, so step two, as Kylie had mentioned, is based on the most recent management track assessment. So uh, SCUP had a management track assessment in 2023, and biomass was about 2.5 times the biomass target. So for SCUP, we land in this very high category. And then for step three, if we just follow that across, we land in the 10% reduction harvest category, um, similar to the situation we were in last year. Um, additionally, I'd like to note that for SCUP, the recreational accountability measures were triggered based on a comparison of 2020 through 2022 average recreational dead catch to the 2020 through 2022 average ACL, as shown in the table on this slide. Um, with total average, with a total average overage of about 126% over the average ACL. Um, specifically, the accountability measure triggered states that the adjustments to measures will be made, taking into account the performance of the measures and conditions that led to the overage. Um, but the council received a letter from GARFO indicating no additional action is required for 2024 to address recent overages. Um, given the 10% reduction taken last year, so in 2023, as well as improvements made to the recreation demand model. So given the percent change approach table I showed a few slides ago, as well as the accountability measures letter from GARFO, um, that means that both federal and state measures collectively will need to achieve a 10% reduction in harvest um, and nothing in addition to that. So if we subtract 10% from the RDM median estimate, so that 15.29 million pounds, that results in a harvest target about, of about 13.76 million pounds. So before moving on to monitoring committee feedback, I'd also like to acknowledge a topic that's come up uh, several times throughout the course of this year, and that's the recreational January through April federal waters closure that's currently in place. So just as a refresher, as I noted at the beginning of the presentation, uh, last year in December, the council and board agreed to modify federal uh, waters measures, and that included a shortened season um, from May 1st through December 31st. So um, effectively a January 1st through April 30th closure. Um, throughout the course of the year, um, there was some expressed concern about the federal season disproportionately impacting some states. Uh, specifically, some states like New Jersey expressed the importance of wave one and two to their for hire industry. However, some northern states um, expressed support for the shortened season, given these states usually take the bulk of the required reduction as they did in 2023. And there was also expressed desire for consistency between state and federal regulations. Um, some states also expressed concern with the accuracy of wave one and two MRIP data and gave examples of how in the past there has been situations where a single MRIP estimate in, for example, Massachusetts resulted in um, an estimate of about a million pounds harvested. 
Um, so this topic came up again uh, in August of 2023. And at that meeting, uh, Garfo indicated that if the forthcoming recreational management measure setting process indicated that that season was no longer needed, uh, NOAA could publish a rule by the end of 2023 to modify that federal season for 2024. So the season would not go into effect come next year. Um, so given the lack of MRIP data and some of the concerns with wave two MRIP data, um, the monitoring committee did recommend an analysis of SCUP VTR data, uh, similar to what has been done in the past for black sea bass, um, a, a way to estimate total recreational harvest during waves one and two. So the analysis is presented in this table and the first three columns is, is really just to provide details related to the number of reported trips used in the analysis, as well as average number of anglers per trip and average number of fish harvested per angler. And then the next two columns, so column five and six, um, shows the average annual for higher scup harvest by month reported through the VTRs. Um, the first column is in number of fish since that's how it's reported. And then the next column over is converting number of fish to pounds of fish. Um, and that was done using an average MRIP estimate, uh, estimated weight of landed fish for all modes, and we used 2018 through 2022 data. So that average weight multiplier ended up being about 0 0.94 pounds. So basically just applying that poundage to the numbers of fish columns to get total pounds. Um, and then to get the estimate of harvest beyond the for hire sector, it was assumed that the average proportion of wave six so November through December, MRIP data by mode would be similar to that of wave one and two. So again, using average MRIP data for the same five years, um, that average proportion of harvest from wave six came out to be about 18% for higher um, and 82% private. So those proportions were applied to column six to get a total estimate of recreational harvest by month. Um, so if we look at the number in that lower right-hand corner, um, if this estimate is accurate, it's about 6,452 pounds of scup are harvested um, from January through April, which is a small proportion of total annual harvest, um, only representing about 0.004% of total harvest. Um, so effectively, this season in federal waters has minimal effect on overall scup harvest. Um, so the monitoring committee met in mid-November and then again last week, December 7th, to discuss multiple points that I covered throughout this presentation. Um, during the November meeting, the monitoring committee was supportive of using the RDM um, for estimating scup harvest and using an 80% confidence interval. And as discussed on a previous slide, that results in a 10% reduction in harvest under the percent change approach. Uh, during the December meeting, the monitoring committee was also supportive of the VTR analysis. Um, when reviewing the analysis, there was some discussion on possibly breaking down the total estimated recreational harvest um, to try to predict uh, federal waters only harvest. Um, but given the removal of SCUP during January through April with such a low poundage based on the uh, analysis shown on the previous slide, they didn't think it was necessary. Um, they also noted that wave one and two participants primarily operate in federal waters based on past and more recent stakeholder feedback, uh, further supporting, uh, not further breaking down um, the harvest estimate. And then uh, the MC did suggest uh, in the future, if we did want to explore this, we could look at wave six proportion data um, as possibly a better estimate um, but they didn't think that was necessary at this time. And they also noted that, you know, MRIP wave data is not currently available online. And so we actually couldn't uh, explore this option um, before the meeting. Um, and so this whole, you know, wave MRIP data not being available um, kind of piqued a different discussion. And the monitoring committee was overall frustrated about this fact. Um, and how it's no longer available. They noted that this situation is a prime example of the need to have access to such information and that the lack of this information can really hinder responsive and informed management decisions. Um, during the December meeting, the board, uh, a board member also questioned uh, potential impl 
implications of black sea on um, black sea bass discards if the federal water scope closure was removed. Um, reiterating a similar comment made by the monitoring committee um, at their November meeting. Um, so during the meeting, um, it was noted that Emirate Black Sea Black Sea Bass discards by wave data was available for the MC to look at, um, but it would be difficult to use that data to assess, you know, what fisheries those discards are coming from. Um, additionally, staff expressed that um, we could investigate Black Sea Bass discards using BTR data um, and look at specifically Black Sea Bass discards on trips that also reported catching scup, um, but at the time it was unclear if there was enough data to support this type of analysis. Um, so overall, the monitoring committee recommended maintaining current federal water measures with the exception of this January through April closure and that adjustments be made to state waters uh, through the commission process to achieve that full 10% reduction. Um, and as Kylie noted, the advisory panel also met. Um, we met last week on December 4th to gather feedback on um, all three species, so summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass. Um, for SCUP, multiple advisors expressed frustration towards the required 10% reduction, and several advisors uh, said the reduction was not necessary given biomass is so high, and instead that measure should be liberalized. Um, one advisor noted that significant regulatory changes were made in New Jersey, and he expressed that SCUP harvest out of New Jersey has uh, or is not significant, yet it's the only state that imposed an August 1st start date. And he went on to explain that these regulations resulted in a significant decrease in effort as well as catch, and further reductions could put these boats, uh, specifically for hire boats, out of business. Uh, multiple for hire advisors advocated for establishing recreational sector separation. Um, these advisors argued that since headboats and charter boats closely track and report their scup catch, um, their operations should not face reductions aligned with the private recreational fishery. Um, some advisors, however, did voice opposition to uh, recreational sector separation. One advisor warned that under a separate for higher quota, the uh, sector could um, see in-season shutdowns and felt that recreational sector separation could lead to some unintended consequences. Um, another advisor questioned whether emerging BTR data um, accurately captures total for higher catch, um, including discards, and argued that more accountability was still needed before this information is used in management. Um, however, related to um, the comment about uh, VTR data not being accurate, uh, there were two advisors that disagreed with that and noted that for higher captains are aware of the importance of accurate data, and so there should be no hesitation using this information to inform management. Um, multiple advisors were also supportive of removing the January through April federal waters closure. Um, one advisor was especially supportive of remo removing the season for the for hire sector and noted that removal of the closure would provide critical fishing opportunities without risk to over harvest. Um, other advisors who supported removing the season agreed with the VTR analysis uh, presented today and felt that such analysis was appropriate given um, the wave one and M wave two MRIP data limitations. And they felt the analysis accurately represented the limited amount of harvest that takes place during those months. Um, one advisor, however, did note that federal VTR data does not capture harvest um, in by state only permitted vessels that are operating solely in state waters. And then another advisor recommended adding 2023 VTR data to the analysis. Um, and then a, a third advisor questioned the 0 0.94 pound uh, average weight multiplier and th thought that that was uh, low for SCUP. And then uh, another advisor that participates in the commercial fishery expressed frustration over the lack of accountability in the recreational fishery compared to the commercial sector. Um, he expressed that until private recreational catch can be fully accounted for, uh, management cuts will continue to unfairly impact commercial and for hire fishermen um, who follow strict reporting requirements. And he argued that such data deficiencies are really the root of our problems and that um, until we get clear information, we won't have a grasp on the, on the number of fish that are actually removed from the ocean. 
Um, so in summary, uh, the percent change approach uh, with using the RDM as well as the 80% confidence interval, as I mentioned, results in a 10% required reduction for 2024. Um, and the resulting harvest target would equal about 13.76 million pounds. Um, the monitoring committee recommended maintaining federal waters measures with the exception of that um, January through April closure and that adjustments to state waters be made through the commission process to achieve that full 10% in reduction. Um, and as in the past, the technical committee will need to develop regional and or state proposals in early 2024. And given the percent change approach measures are to stay constant over the next two years, these measures set today and then by the states in early next year will remain constant over uh, 2024 and 2025 unless major changes indicate otherwise. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I could take any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Um, my questions are for Hannah. Um, so first I want to confirm that commercial quota is increased by 25% or something equivalent to that and that um, recreational fisheries being, uh, you have a 10% reduction proposed. Is that accurate? Yeah, so the commercial quota, I actually have a slide on, are you talking about what it couldn't increase compared to last year, 2023? Yeah, so um, this is what was passed um, in August. So the commercial quota in 2023, I believe, was uh, pretty significantly lower than 21.15 million pounds. I think it was, sorry, let me just look it up really quick. I thought I had it in here. Okay, so. Uh, the commercial quota in 2023 was 14.01 million pounds. So in 2024, an increase by 7 million pounds approximately. Um, but the RHL also increased. So in 2023, the RHL was 9.27 million pounds and increased to 13.18 million pounds in 2024. So about 4 million pounds. Uh, so my second question is, goes back to the timing that uh, this uh, winter closure would be removed. Would that be essentially for the 2025 fishing year? Would it be in place for 2024? So it would be for the 2024 fishing season, actually. So um, since this came up in August, uh, Garfo staff has been preparing for possible removal of it. So they're prepared to, um, and I think it was published in the proposed rule. So they're prepared to remove it if, if this body would like right. to. Okay, thank you. And last question. Um, so I understand the VTR analysis and uh, I understand which didn't, how you did it. I'm just wondering, does the RDM model kind of consider wave one and two harvest the same light at approximately 6,500 pounds or does it, or is it looking at the EMRIP history and with some of those volatile estimates? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't know if Lou or Scott's on the, on the line and could uh, speak to this, but I don't believe that the RDM at this point looks at um, harvest by wave, or at least we don't get that output. Um, I imagine it, it could to some extent, but another thing with the RDM is it can't separate state versus federal waters. So it'd be difficult to use it to basically assess, you know, what sort of impact this closure would have in just federal waters only. But I don't know if Scott or Lou is on the line and, and want to expand on that. John, go ahead. Yeah, just to follow up, my, my only concern is that um, while I'm generally in support of, of that opening, uh, I just I am concerned about how the RDM would consider its impact on whatever, you know, the 10% reduction uh, requires. Any current? Thank you. I don't know if Chelsea or Hannah can answer this, but uh, in terms of what the monitoring committee did to try to project what it thinks harvest would be in wave one or two, did they consider going back and trying to sort of fact check that with what Virginia has been seeing with their black sea bass landings to try to 
see if that's overestimating or underestimating. At least we have a fishery that is occurring. I, I recognize that fishery is only occurring in the month of February, but it might give us a gauge of intra, you know, effort level, um, both for private and recreational. I think it's categorized by both by looking at private and the party and charter boat, but I could be misremembering that. Yeah, so that didn't come up with the monitoring committee. Any more questions or comments around the table? John Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. And I just wanted to confirm that based on the monitoring committee recommendations, states that don't have a state water fishery would just be status quo. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think the technical committee will meet in early of next year to kind of discuss um, how they want to how they want to do it through the commission process. But it's not laid out in the commission process exactly um, regional versus state and and how that's all done. So I think the technical committee will convene and have that discussion, and then based on that discussion, move forward with what states have to do. And I'll let Chelsea speak. And so, unlike Summer Flounder, like Hannah mentioned, there's not predefined regions in the FMP. So that 10% reduction last year, when the states took a 10% reduction, they defined the regions as the northern region. Region was Massachusetts through New York. New Jersey was its own region, and then the southern states were their own region. And so, again, the board can provide direction to the technical committee. Um, but there's no predetermined way that they have to look at it. They just have to hit that 10% reduction. Question from the audience, Captain Victor. This fishery right here, along with what's going to happen tomorrow morning, is a prime example of what's wrong with the system. It's the biomass is so big that we go over it every year. If this was flounder right now, granted, we're only taking a 10% cut, but you'd be cutting our throats if we went over flounder 128% for like the last five years. This is why the public once again, doesn't trust the board and council because of this fishery and sea bass. And this is a fishery that New Jersey got took the hardest hit this year. We got closed down until August 1st. We're the only one and we're not even in the top of the bracket like Massachusetts, New York. Our party boats depend on this fishery in the wintertime. I know one of them's online right now and he might make a comment on his own, but I'm defending him. But here's the prime example why they don't trust you. It's so rebuilt that you're not even making the target where we can't overfish it. Some, please, somebody smarter than me, tell me why. If the target is the biomass is so big, why are we keeping the target so low that every year we're going to overfish it? And and the shore base numbers, I can't see how they're even right. In New Jersey, I can't we don't even probably have a shore base fishery. Most of our fisheries in federal waters. And only the big head boats go out there in the wintertime in New York and New Jersey. They're the only ones targeting these fish. I'm not saying our reporting system is perfect. Somebody made that clear to me earlier. We're probably not absolutely perfect but we're definitely better than MRFs. We might not get every single fish, but we get a hell of a lot of them that we don't have to extrapolate one fish to a million. I mean, this fishery and tomorrow are the two fisheries that should not be taking a cut. They should be getting, these should be the fisheries that we get the numbers on so we can leave flounder alone. That's that's all I have to say, and I, I mean, I hope you just work on this because we, we have to fix this. I mean, or every year it's going to be the same thing. We're going over 128 percent. 
whatever the percentages are every single year. We're not getting penalized for this fishery. Like if this was a flounder, we'd be getting crushed. Thank you. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan Lap Seafreeze. Um, I have to agree with some of what Victor said. Um, we heard from the commission earlier that the that measures that are set are expected to achieve the RHL, and that's simply not true. With the harvest control rule and the percent change approach, the RHL has gone out the window. Really, Magnuson has gone out the window. Um, you know, council documents themselves state that the harvest control rule decouples recreational management from the RHL, which is the problem. If you read the staff documents for SCUP, the rec sector exceeded the RHL in 2022 by 186%. In 2021, the RHL was exceeded by 174%. In 2020, the RHL was exceeded by 98%. In 2022, um, the actual OFL was exceeded for this stock, and that is called overfishing. Um, it doesn't matter if a stock is, a high, is at a high biomass level. If there is continual overharvest, especially by numbers like this, the stock will drop. The only thing that's being proposed here is a 10% cut because of the harvest control rule, not 186% cut. And my question is, when the overharvest continues, as it is continued, as it has continued for the past three years, and is is going to continue, who pays? My company has achieved MSC certification for SCUP. We are spending a lot of resources and finances developing an MSC market. But if the stock drops and it's no longer at a high biomass level because of continual or continual um, over harvest, and we lose that MSC certification because the stock status drops, who is liable? Who do I get damages from? For tens of thousands to maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, who's liable? Because if this was a commercial issue, we would be getting cut by 186%. Thank you. Tom Bode. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Fody. I've been dealing with SCUP since 1990-something when we basically looked at it. We set up quotas that weren't realistic on the recreational sector, and we thought about eight years ago when we started trying to do the reallocation of moving some of the recreational quota in a larger package because commercial quota is being under-harvested by big numbers, and we were going over because you basically made us, made us go over because of the amount of fish that's out there. And we really need to get the, the quota that we historically should have had, but we didn't. And that was because of the makeup of the council, we lost the vote. And I can understand that nobody wanted to give up a dime in this, in this fight. And if we would have been there with that probably extra percentage, we wouldn't be over. We'd be just catching what our quota share is. But because you restricted us and you didn't do the proper quota management, then you know we're back in the same shoes. And it started when we gave up quota many years ago because there was going to be changing the mesh size and we we're going to not discard as much as we did back then because discards were a huge problem with the scub fishery because they were being caught in the squid fishery they were being caught in other fisheries and a lot of that didn't disappear but we got the reduction in quota we gave it up because somebody said we'll never get managed quota in scub because that'll never happen now those were back in the 90s when we didn't have any regulations when Chris wasn't even shaving at that point. And, you know, that's when we didn't have those quotas. And then over the years, we put the quotas in effect, we lose, we lost because we basically got the wrong quota to begin with over the historical records. So it's a problem because the size of the thing. And, and most of this, well, not only based on what our numbers are, you know, I always think of the golf, when somebody, when the Congress pays the appropriate enough money to do proper stock assessment or red, redfish, they found a lot more fish out there than we were estimating. And I think the, the stuff is true here. We underestimate the stocks because recreational fisheries only happen when there's abundance of fish. Because there's no fish out there, we're not catching. 
we're not efficient. We're very inefficient at catching fish. So it's got to be an abundance of fish for us to make this, us go for a quota. Thank you. Mike Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association. So I believe New York caught 8 million pounds of scop, according to MRAP. 8 million pounds. That's 22,000 pounds a day for the entire year. How is that possible? How? Like the fish have to be flying out of the water for that kind of catch to be happening. And so it's really frustrating for, do I have that right? Yeah, how about that? 10 million pounds. How? How? So I just don't understand when I hear people come up here and say, the rec sector is so unaccountable. <clears throat> if this was the other sector, we would be held to such and such. I, I'm interpreting those comments as they are interested in us being penalized for the shortcomings in the catch data. That's the only explanation I can come up with because the recreational sector is abiding by the regulations that are set by this council and the board. And in addition to that, the recreational sector has accountability measures as required by Magnuson. <clears throat> and so I, I'm really struggling with what's going on here, which is a scenario in which we know that this data, that these data are very imprecise and yet we are trying to do surgical precision management using them and advocates come up here and hammer at that point. And I feel like it, it's totally misleading. Um, I'm pretty tired of hearing about it. Perhaps all of you are as well. We need a better system. We're trying to find fixes that help address some of the shortcomings in the MRIP data because we cannot fix or address the MRIP data. And I wish that we could all work together to find those solutions. Coming back to the table, any questions or comments? Justin? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a process question. So, you know, I should know the answer to this, but last year we, you know, we went through this process of assessing uh, harvest against uh, projected harvest from the RDM against the RHL. Uh, decided that SCUP was in the 10% reduction category. Uh, states collectively took action to reduce harvest by 10%. We're back doing that again this year. Um, is the intent that we are just like we just did for summer flounder setting measures here for two years at a time? Just wanted to clarify that. Yes, two years. Seeing no more hands around the table. And I believe you have a motion ready. Would you like to bring that up, please? All right, it's back to the council having the first crack at this one. Would now that hopefully we've had a couple seconds to look at it, would anybody from the council like to entertain this motion? John Clark and Mike Luis, he's going to second it. Okay, I could make it for the board. John, you want to go for the 
Yeah, I'm good for doing it for the board too. Okay. Wes. And Mike, you want to do it? Second for both. John, since you volunteered, you're going to read the motion into the record, please. Sure thing, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Move to adopt a 13.76 million pound recreational harvest target for SCUP in 2024-2025, with a 10% coastwide harvest reduction to be taken in 2024, based on the application of the percent change approach and the outputs of the recreation demand model. The 10% coastwide harvest reduction will be achieved by the states through the commission process. Federal waters measures would consist of a year round, January through December, open season, 40 fish possession limit, and 10 inch minimum size limit. Do we need any discussion on the motion from the council? Mike Penny. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to make sure that it's clear and <clears throat> that I'm understanding that the wording of this motion can, because it says the federal waters measures, which would be for 2024 and 2025 or January through through um, December year round season, that implicit in that is a recommendation, would be a recommendation from the council and the board that we, as soon as we can, remove the closure that's currently on the books for 2024 which we had discussed and staff noted that we had discussed in in August. Um, and we have the ability to remove that in the final rule to implement the specifications, which we expect to publish by the end of the, this calendar year. I just want to be, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. The intent of this is that it is a recommendation by both bodies to remove that closure. Yes, I believe it is. Sure. Any objections? Anybody? Everybody agree with that? Or with that, let's go ahead and uh, see all those in favor on the council only. Please raise your hand on the computer. Amy, this is a council only motion. Okay, thank you. Nineteen in favor, would everybody lower their hands, please? Anybody object to the motion? Seeing none, any abstentions? One abstention, Mike Pentney. With that, the motion passes 19 0 to 1. Nicola. To the board, do board members need any time to caucus on this motion? Seeing none, uh, is there any objection to the motion from the board? Seeing none, uh, the motion carries uh, with one abstention from Garfo. Thank you. Apologies. Abstention from PRFC as well, too, for the record. Motion carries with two abstentions. Tony, do you have a comment? Just a point of clarification in the sense that if NOAA does open the fishery, which was the intent of the board and council here, there is no state that is currently open except for Delaware through North Carolina in that wave one and two time frame. If a state intends to open during that wave one through two time frame, they would need to ask the board to, to do that opening, and that would need to get approved by the management board sometime between now and when you would want to open. I just want to provide that clarity 
we would need to figure out a way to account for the fish during wave one, MRIP is sampling in wave two, so we would have estimates in theory for wave two, but wave one, there is no accounting in the past. You know, Virginia has pulled together a system where they account for fish and then they adjust their measures on the back end of their season to account for the fish that they harvest during, um, during the month of February. I think that, it, I mean, it's up to the board to figure out what you would want to do if a state does open, um, that is a process that has occurred. Um, so I don't know if there's going to be a state that wants to open this year or not, but I just want to put that out there. See a couple um, concerned faces around the room. So I feel like this needs a little bit more discussion, but that was not my understanding that um, my understanding was that if states wanted to open, if they're already closed January through April, they would be using the RDM and we all acknowledge that there's not wave one data, but uh, we would be using the RDM to take that into consideration and whatever measures are modeled for next year to achieve a 10% coastwide reduction collectively. And that we have not established any type of process like we have for the, the black sea bass, you know, special February fishery um, and, and here. It's the will of the board to not account for the fish that uh, that would occur during that time frame. That it is the will of the board to not account for the fish. The RDM doesn't pick up wave one. It doesn't. It will not adjust for fishing during wave one because we don't have accounting for the fish during that time frame. And I I do think that we should get a response from Lou. I'm kind of hoping he's listening right now. I don't even know if it accounts for much in wave two either because not there haven't really been states that have been open in a long time, I think, during wave two. And so I don't know what it's picking up to try to figure out what would happen if you open during that time. I think there, oh, sorry. Uh, so there is some wave two data um, on, on a state by state basis, but like like we've talked about, intercepts are very low. So the uncertainty around that data is probably much higher compared to wave three, four, or five, and, and so on. Chris Batsavich, your hands up. Yeah, th thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I understood it the way you did. Um, and the way the motion's written is you know, the, the board and council uh, acknowledge the fact that wave one harvest is going on, but we're not accounting for it. Um, the, the analysis that Hannah provided shows that at least it, it appears to be very low. Um, ideally, I think we would account for it. Um, yeah, I've, I've mentioned my concerns before about you know, RHLs and allowing wave one harvest. You know, it's kind of like free fish. Um, yeah, it, it might be something that the board and council wants to consider in the future as far as a way to monitor uh, wave one harvest, similar to how we handle black sea bass in February. Um, uh, in, in the meantime, maybe another option would be, you know, the analysis that Hannah provided as far as looking at BTR information, if there shows to be increased um, uh, f fishing effort, you know, through VTRs, then, uh, board maybe does you know, some follow-up work on uh, trying to make sure those that harvest is accounted for um, again against the RHL. But yeah, I mean, T Tony's right. Um, you know, if, if, if there's no catch history there uh, in, in MRIP, then you know, the, the RDM doesn't really have anything to, to grab onto for, for predicting what, uh, what catch might be. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's a concern, but I mean, the way this is passed is we're, we're acknowledging that right now, but perhaps we want to Think about next steps um, if this becomes a, a bigger a bigger fisher. Having a slight sidebar here, also wave one and two haven't been closed yet in any state, right? All of our states that closed January through April, it didn't really happen until like April or May or even June this year. So there hasn't really been a closure that we're now opening. So I don't. I think there is a, a change in harvest to model. 
there isn't no state north of Delaware is open currently during that time. So if a state opens and the board doesn't approve that opening, which is the board approves state measures that would impact the season, I'm just trying to figure out how the board approves those that season prior to the season occurring when all the states are closed. Chelsea, did you have a clarification for us? Yeah, I was going to just point of clarification in that this year, a lot of states didn't get their closures in in time, but the state regulations and the proposed regulations were you know, closures from January to May. So even though the states may not have closed by that time, that is what the proposed and written rules were for 2023. But any wave two data from 2023 that is included in the RDM will be an open season for a state if they were open then. So I, I think that this maybe is something that the technical committee, we can continue to that. Um, discussion as to how the RDM accounts for this, what's necessary, how how any measures need to offset that opening um, rather than belabor the point here. I guess I'm just trying to provide a path for a state to open is what I'm trying to do here if a state wants to open. Because right now the regulations that we have on the books for the commission New Jersey North is closed. And so I'm trying to provide a path if somebody wants to open up. Are you indicating that there is a need for this coming January through April for there need to be board approval of, of that? I think so. That it wasn't just inherent in the motion as was indicated by Mike and that we voted on. It's federal water measures and they got to come into the state to land those fish. Guess I'm trying to get an indication. Is there a state that is going to ask to open their fishery or not? If there is not, then this is not a problem. But if there is, then we need to get them a process. I can probably provide that process tomorrow morning, but I'm just trying to figure out if I need a process and if we can have some time tomorrow morning to outline that process, that would be great. But right now, all of those states are closed and we don't have a way to approve measures to open them at this time. Uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if this is the sort of thing that could be addressed through email vote. You know, if, if essentially states were able to indicate sometime soon that they wish to open during this period and were able to indicate what regulations they wanted to adopt, if the board could take action through email vote to approve that. I'm just trying to establish, like, I'm trying to figure out if we need to figure out a way to get the TC to review, look at. I just want to know if we need a process and if we, so I can provide that process to any state that wants to open. That's all. I'm, yes, but we can do an email vote. Uh, John Mascalco. So, Tony, this would be something in addition to what Nicola had originally suggested in terms of 
the regional states working with the RDM model to analyze the 10 percent reduction that while including the opening. I guess my point is, if someone is going to open this year in February or January, then that needs to happen very quickly so the board can approve those measures, because right now they are closed. So I'm trying to provide a path. You Maybe we can use the RDM. I'm not really sure, because I don't understand what the RDM is, is analyzing um, for the TCE to provide any comments to the board. But if someone's going to want to open January 1, that needs to happen between now and January 1 for the board to approve it. And so I'm just trying to figure out what set deadlines for states to get back to us so we can get the TC moving if we need to. No one's going to open, then we don't need to have this discussion. You're not my problem. Uh, Joseph, you know? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm not, I'm not going to help in any way. I just, my understanding was that, you know, the the recommendation was that, that this, that the season could be open because it's a fraction of a percentage and, and we're, you know, go back and achieve your 10% reduction. Mm -hmm. No additional offset. So then it becomes a yes or no question, not yes or no, and a proposal for a TC review. If it's a yes or no question, then yeah, we, we need to be able, I, I think we should have an opportunity to have the board vote on whether or not states are going to try and open. And what, whatever date that is, we understand that maybe we don't make wave one, but it would be uh, a wave two opening. But um, if, if we're having um, an additional meeting, already for flu in February, is that right? And, you know, maybe that's the venue or or maybe as Justin said, it's an email vote, but I'm still not thinking of this as a yes or no, not a not a proposal. Mike Lucy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, maybe I'd suggest so I kind of see it like Joe. Uh, I think this board this week, even if we had a little time between now and tomorrow morning, over a, a quick discussion tonight or even a breakfast tomorrow to come up with um, a motion that generalizes it, it's not a necess, it's not necessarily a proposal written by the state that we'd have to approve it's a general acceptance of the terms of a state opening what what is that state going to give back to the process if they open is there going to be information that they'll generate to collect to be able to account for what happens during that opening if it's not being collected by MRIP? So if we can all agree that there are certain conditions or provisions that fall with a, fall into the state's responsibility if they choose to open, then I think we're covered as far as saying, okay, well, you do this. We'll say it. We'll, we'll, the board will let you will allow for the opening if you can agree to do X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> and I'd feel comfortable with that and give the state the latitude to be able to, you know, make some make adjustments or deal with their own state issue as they choose, as they see fit. Um, so that's my one point. The second point, uh, as far as a longer term process for the future, you know, for, and I don't, I don't think there's anybody here online. I mean, there could be maybe somebody in the audience that works in the EMRA program, but at some point, the EMRA and the information that's collected through EMRA needs to start recognizing the fact that there are Jan days in January when it's 70 degrees in the Mid Atlantic, and that fishing is likely going to not be what it once was back in, you know, related to Tom. You know, back in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, it, things are changing, and the EMRA, the program that collects the information, needs to evolve to that. And maybe they need to start collecting information in Wave One, so that we have the ability to manage a mild winter uh, down the road and in the, and in the future. So um, I'll leave it there. But I think. As long as you're okay with that, Madam Chair, I'd be comfortable in having that discussion over the course of the next few hours and 
into tomorrow and take up a mo uh, I could even craft a motion if you need me to uh, for tomorrow. Is there any objection to that approach that we're going to um, resume this topic briefly tomorrow before Black Sea Bass to hash out a, a plan as to how the board, if and how the board needs to approve states to reopen in January and April of next year? All right, seeing none, we'll do that and take some time to have some discussions before then. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, just related to that, um, we're, we're working to get the final rule for specs submitted like tomorrow. It's supposed to be tonight, but tomorrow morning. Um, so we would like to know, because if none of the states intend to open, then we don't need to open. And um, so it'd be good to know if the states do intend to open so that we can make sure that we can facilitate that through our final rule. Um, so that's, I mean, Tony's right. We need to know whether the states are actually interested in, in opening. Chris Basavich? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, so I guess the southern states are open year round, at least in state waters. If uh, this proposed rule went through to open federal waters, I mean, it would allow those states that are open in state waters for their boats to go out in federal waters and land. So I guess it wouldn't be off or not. I mean, it would be small, a small fraction of the recreational fishery, but uh, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and I guess North Carolina too, um, those boats would be able to you know, go out in the federal waters if if that, that season went away in this proposed rule. So I guess it would be, it would have some validity, at least for a small portion of it, re regardless of what the states north of Delaware do. All right, well, it looks like commission, you guys got some homework tonight. Um, with that, uh, before we close out, Chris, do you have an announcement to make? Two things. If you're a council member, we'll meet here tomorrow at nine o'clock, this room for the uh, council photo. Uh, the second thing is hospitality. We do have hospitality tonight. It's in room 230, 230. The, uh, the one problem might be for the folks in the back who are not staying at the hotel is you need a key to get up to the second floor. So find a buddy, uh, staff, staff has uh, keys, obviously they're staying here, they can help you get up to that floor. But uh, everyone's invited, hospitality's in room 230. Thanks. All right, with that, we'll see everyone in the morning, uh, a little bit after nine, once we get the council photo done.